Recorded Books presents an unabridged recording of Ivy and Bean by Annie Barrows Narrated by Cassandra Morris and directed by Claudia Howard No thanks. Before Bean met Ivy, she didn't like her. Bean's mother was always saying that Bean should try playing with the new girl across the street. But Bean didn't want to. She's seven years old, just like you, said her mother. And she seems like such a nice girl. You could be friends. I already have friends, said Bean. And that was true. Bean did have a lot of friends. But really, she didn't want to play with Ivy because her mother was right. Ivy did seem like such a nice girl. Even from across the street, she looked nice. But nice, Bean knew, is another word for boring. Ivy sat nicely on her front steps. Bean zipped around her yard and yelled. Ivy had long, curly red hair pushed back with a sparkly headband. Bean's hair was black, and it only came to her chin because it got tangled if it was any longer. When Bean put on a headband, it fell off. Ivy wore a dress every day. Bean wore a dress when her mother made her. Ivy was always reading a big book. Bean never read big books. Reading made her jumpy. Bean was sure that Ivy never stomped in puddles. She was sure that Ivy never smashed rocks to find gold. She was sure that Ivy had never once in her whole life climbed a tree and fallen out. Bean got bored just looking at her. So when her mother said she should play with Ivy, Bean just shook her head. No thanks, she said. You could give it a try. You might like her, said Bean's mom. All aboard, next train for boring is leaving now, yelled Bean. Her mother frowned. That's not very nice, Bean. I was nice. I said no thanks, said Bean. I just don't want to, okay? Okay, okay, her mother sighed. Have it your way. So for weeks and weeks, Bean didn't play with Ivy. But one day something happened that changed her mind. Bean hatches a plan. It all began because Bean was playing a trick on her older sister. Bean's older sister was named Nancy. She was 11. Nancy thought Bean was a pain and a pest. Bean thought Nancy was a boogerhead. Ever since she turned 11, Nancy had been acting like she was Bean's mother. She ordered Bean around in a grown-up voice. Comb your hair. No more pretzels. Brush your teeth. Say please. Bean's mother said that Nancy was going through a stage. Bean knew what that meant. That meant Nancy was bossy. Bean also knew that nobody likes bossy kids, so she was trying to help Nancy be done with her stage. Here's how she helped. She bugged Nancy until Nancy freaked out. Bean thought this was pretty helpful. The afternoon that Bean got her great idea, she was shopping with her mom and Nancy. Actually, Bean was being dragged along by her mom and Nancy. Bean hated shopping. Nancy loved, loved, loved it. Nancy was trying on skirts, lots of skirts. She put on a purple skirt. She looked at her front in the mirror, then she turned to the side. Then she turned around and tried to look at her behind. Looks good, said Bean, let's go. Be patient just a little longer, Bean, said Bean's mother. I think it's cute, honey, she said to Nancy. Nancy looked in the mirror some more. Do you think the pockets are dumb? I like the pockets, said Bean's mom. Get it, get it, get it, moaned Bean. 
She had never been so bored in her entire life. She was so bored she fell on the floor. Then she took a tiny peek up at the lady in the dressing room next door. Yow. Get up, Bean, said her mother, this minute. Bean got up and sat on the triangle seat again. She waited. Nancy looked at herself. I kind of like it, Nancy said, but it costs $40. That's all my money. I could get two shirts for $40. Don't be a tightwad, said Bean. She had just learned that word. It meant someone who didn't like to spend money. Don't call your sister a tightwad, said Bean's mom. Bean saw Nancy's eyes looking at her in the mirror. Tight wad, Bean mouthed without any sound. Nancy's eyes got narrow, and so quick that their mother didn't see, she stuck out her tongue. Then Nancy turned to their mother and said, I think the skirt costs too much, Mom. I think I'd rather try on some tops. Bean knew then that Nancy was being slow on purpose, just to drive her crazy. Bean thought about kicking her in the shin, but then she got the idea. It was a great idea. It was also a helpful idea, one that would teach Nancy not to be such a tightwad. And best of all, her idea would make Nancy freak out. You'll be sorry, Bean mouthed to Nancy. The Ghost of Pancake Court Bean was hiding inside a big round bush in her front yard. The bush was right next to the sidewalk, and it was very scratchy and sticky inside, but Bean needed to be in the bush for her plan to work. Here's how Bean's plan went. She took a $20 bill out of Nancy's purse and taped a long thread to it. She put the $20 bill on the sidewalk. Then she held on to the other end of the thread and climbed into the bush. Nancy would be coming home from school soon. She would see the money on the sidewalk. She would bend down to pick it up. Bean would quickly pull the money away. And then Nancy would freak out. Bean could hardly wait. There was only one problem. Nancy didn't come. Bean sat inside the bush for a long time. A branch poked her arm. Leaves fell down her shirt. She itched. She waited. Nothing happened. It was very quiet. Bean was hardly ever this quiet for this long. Because there was nothing else to do, she looked at the house across the street. Really, it wasn't across the street. It was around the street. Bean loved her street. The first reason was its name, Pancake Court. The second reason was that it ended in a big circle right in front of Bean's house. Her dad called it a cul-de-sac. Bean called it cool. If Bean started riding her bicycle at the end of the block and pedaled really, really hard, she could whiz around the circle, tilting low over the sidewalk like a motorcycle racer. Slam! Bean looked up. She saw Ivy come out onto her front porch and plop down on the top step. Bean squinted at her. Ivy looked strange. She wasn't wearing a dress today. She was wearing a black bathrobe with lots of little pieces of paper stuck to it. Weird thought Bean. She squinted some more. Instead of a big book, Ivy was carrying a stick painted gold. Bean made a face. What a goony costume, she thought. What a dork. Ivy sat. She didn't do anything. She just sat there all by herself. That was another strange thing about Ivy. She didn't mind being alone. She never played with anyone. Bean played with everyone. Big kids, little kids, 
all the kids in the neighborhood played with Bean. Even crummy Matt, who was so crummy he threw other kids' toys into the road, wanted to play with Bean. She took care of the little kids. When they fell down and got blood all over their knees, Bean would take them home to get Band-Aids. The big kids let her play with them because she had good ideas, like seeing how many backyards they could cross without touching the ground. Bean loved big groups of kids playing big games, like pirates or hide and seek. Sometimes, Bean wished she were an orphan so she could live in an orphanage with a hundred other kids. Of course, she didn't tell her mother and father that. Bean watched Ivy alone on her front porch. Wasn't she lonely? Now Ivy was muttering something that Bean couldn't hear. And then she began to wave the stick in the air. Bean couldn't stand it anymore. What the heck are you doing? Yelled Bean from inside her bush. Ivy looked all around. Bean forgot that Ivy couldn't see her. What's with the stick? She yelled. Ivy's eyes got big. Who's there? She said. Are you a ghost? A ghost? What a great idea! Bean made her voice scratchy and spooky. Yes, she howled. I am the ghost of Mr. Killop. I lived in your house before, and I died there too. Mr. Killop had actually moved to Ohio, but Bean thought it was more interesting to say he had died. I've come to haunt you. Tonight, when you're sleeping, I'll wrap my icy fingers around your neck. Bean, what are you yelling about? Oops, it was Nancy. Bean meets Ivy. Bean peeked out between leaves. Nancy hadn't seen the $20 bill. She was standing on it. Hmm, thought Bean. Her plan was a bust, but if she kept on being a ghost, maybe she could scare Nancy a little. I'm going to wrap my fingers around your neck too, she howled in her spooky voice. And I'm going to spit in your ear. No, you're not, said Nancy. She didn't sound scared. She reached into the bush and yanked Bean out. Stop yelling. That's when she saw the $20 bill. Hey, she said. Where did you get the money? You don't have $20. Then she saw the string. I see what you're doing, burp face. I bet this is my money too. Then she picked up the bill and looked at it. You stole my money. I'm telling mom. She began to pull Bean toward the front door. Uh-oh, thought Bean. None of her ideas were working out today. Now she had two choices. She could go inside with Nancy and face mom, or she could run. So Bean fell over on the ground and started to wail. My ankle, ow, 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 my ankle's killing me, it's sprained. She held her ankle. Nancy frowned. You didn't sprain your ankle, you faker, she said, but she bent down to take a look. That was all Bean needed. She stood up and ran. She ran out of her yard and around Pancake Court until she found herself in front of Ivy's house. Ooh, you're in trouble now, Bernice Blue, yelled Nancy. I'm going to tell Mom. Bernice was Bean's real name. People used it only when they were yelling at her. Bean couldn't help it. She just had to stick her tongue out and say, <laughs> Then she just had to turn around and wiggle her behind at Nancy. That's it, Nancy yelled. I'm getting mom. She stormed into the house. 
For a minute, Bean felt happy. She loved making Nancy mad. But when Nancy was gone, Bean began to worry. Mom hated it when she did more than one bad thing at a time. Bean counted. Taking the money, lying about her ankle, leaving the yard without asking, and wiggling her behind at Nancy. Four things. Five if you counted pretending to be a ghost. Bean was going to be in big trouble. How big? No dessert for sure. No videos for a week, maybe. But it could be even worse. Her mom might send her to her room for the rest of the day. Bean hated that. Hide. Bean looked up. She had forgotten all about Ivy. Ivy was still sitting on her porch. She had been watching the whole time. She knew that the ghost of Mr. Killip was really Bean inside the bush. Bean expected her to be mad, but she didn't look mad. She looked excited. Hide, she said again. Hmm, thought Bean. Maybe boring Ivy was right. If her mom couldn't find her, she couldn't send her to her room. If she stayed out until dark, her parents would stop being mad and start being worried. Her mom might say, oh, my poor little bean, my poor little baby. Then they'd be so happy to see her when she came limping home that they probably wouldn't punish her at all. They might even let her have seconds on dessert. That settled it. Okay, she said to Ivy. Where? Follow me. Ivy came down the stairs and slipped behind a bush growing against her house. Bean followed her and crouched down under the wide leaves. No, get up. This is just the beginning, said Ivy. I'm going to take you to a secret spot. This isn't it, asked Bean. The bush looked pretty good to her. No, this is the passageway. Ivy pressed her back against the house and edged along. Bean edged along too, the wall scraping her back. They turned a corner and edged some more. Ivy's house was big. Halt, said Ivy. Bean halted. Now, said Ivy, close your eyes and I'll take you to the secret spot. What? How come I have to close my eyes? Because it's a secret, said Ivy. Duh. Bean couldn't argue with that. Ivy looked like a wimp, but she didn't talk like one. Bean closed her eyes. She felt Ivy take her by the elbow, and together they went down some steps. A door opened, more steps. Cool, damp air blew in Bean's face. Then they went up some steps. Another door opened. They were outside again. Ivy was taking Bean through some tall grass. Shh, said Ivy suddenly. Bean froze. Crouch down, said Ivy. Bean crouched. There was a silence. Okay, you can get up now. What happened? asked Bean. Spies, said Ivy. Bean figured Ivy was probably making that up. Now you can open your eyes, Ivy said. Ivy hatches a plan. Bean opened her eyes. They were in a corner of Ivy's backyard. There was a big rock on one side and a small tree on the other. Between them was a perfectly round puddle. This is the secret spot, asked Bean. She had expected something more secret looking, like a cave. Yes, they'll never find you here, said Ivy. 
You can stay for as long as you want. I'll bring you food. But I only need to stay until dinner time, Bean said. Ivy looked disappointed. I thought you wanted to run away. I do, but only till dinner. Oh. Bean felt bad about not staying. Wouldn't you get in trouble if your parents found out I was living here? She asked. They don't come out here much, Ivy said. My mom is afraid of ticks. You probably don't ever get in trouble anyway, said Bean, feeling glum. I'm always in trouble. I do too get in trouble, said Ivy. No, you don't, Bean said. You read books all the time. You can't get in trouble for reading books. Ivy said, I will get in trouble, really huge trouble, if I do what I want to do, what I plan to do. Bean waited. Well, what do you plan to do? Ivy looked all around before she whispered, spells, magic, potions. Really? You mean like a witch? Yes. Well, not yet, but I'm going to be a witch, said Ivy. Her eyes were glowing. I'm learning how. Bean looked at Ivy's black bathrobe. It was kind of dirty now, and some of the little pieces of paper had fallen off. Bean saw that the papers were cut into star and moon shapes. Bean also saw that Ivy didn't know how to draw stars. Some of them had four points, and some only had three. The moons didn't look so good either. Is that a witch's robe? She asked. Yeah, said Ivy. Did you make it yourself? Asked Bean. Yeah. It's nice, said Bean politely. It didn't look like a witch's robe. It looked goofy. I didn't know you could learn to be a witch. I thought you just had to be one. That's what most people think, said Ivy. But I'm learning. I probably know more than most born witches my age. I just learned this spell that makes you invisible. Wow. Bean could use that for sure. Will you teach me? That would be great. I haven't done it yet, Ivy admitted. You've got to have a dead frog. Oh. It would be really mean to kill a frog. Yeah. That's why I dug this pond. Ivy pointed to the puddle with her gold stick. I'm hoping a frog will come here and die. Bean didn't mention that it looked like a puddle. Wow, she said. What's the stick for? That's my wand, said Ivy. Bean couldn't help it. She burst out laughing. That's not a wand. That's just a stick painted gold. It is too a wand. Now Ivy looked mad. And you better watch out or I'll use it on you. Bean stopped laughing. Use it how? I'll cast the dancing spell on you. You won't be able to stop dancing for the rest of your life. Like this. She started jumping up and down, kicking out her legs and waggling her arms. Could you really? Asked Bean. Ivy stopped dancing. Maybe. I was just going to test it when you started yelling about being a ghost. Who were you going to test it on? Asked Bean. Ivy's face turned red. Nobody, she said. Bean could tell she was lying. Come on, who? Ivy's face got redder. Come on, tell me, said Bean. Ivy looked at the dirt. You, she said in a low voice. Me, yelped Bean. What did I ever do to you? I'm sorry, 
said Ivy. She did look sorry. That's okay, said Bean. There was a pause. My mother keeps on saying what a nice girl you are, Ivy said. She's always telling me I should play with you. It's driving me nuts. Bean couldn't believe it. That's what my mother says about you. That's so funny. But you're not nice at all. You're a witch. Ivy giggled. You're not very nice either. You were doing that ghost thing in the bush. Bean was embarrassed. The part about the icy fingers was good, said Ivy. What were you doing in there anyway? Bean sat down on the rock. I was waiting for Nancy. That's my sister. She's a total pain in the kazoo. I put $20 on a string, and I was going to pull it out of her hand when she reached down to pick it up. Ivy nodded. Is that why she got mad at you? No, she got mad at me because it was her $20. Bean felt glum again. Ivy saw that Bean was worrying. Are you going to be in trouble? Yeah, probably. I'm not supposed to mess with her money. Bean thought. You don't have a going back in time spell, do you? No, those are hard, said Ivy. She looked at her pond. I wish I had a dead frog. That would be good, said Bean. But wait a second. What about the dancing spell? Could you put it on Nancy? So she'll dance for the rest of her life? How is that going to get you out of trouble? Ivy asked. It's not, said Bean, but it would be really funny. Beware. Once they had agreed to cast a spell on Nancy, Bean stared long and hard at Ivy's robe. Those little pieces of paper had to go. The first thing we have to do is make you look more like a witch, she said. Ivy looked down at her bathrobe. Why? Bean tried to explain without hurting Ivy's feelings. If you want other people to believe you're a witch, you have to look more witchy. But I don't care if other people believe me, said Ivy. Bean shook her head. What a weird kid. It'll make your spells better, too. You've got to dress for success. Her mother said that all the time. It usually meant that Bean had to put on a clean shirt. Besides, it'll be fun. Do you have face paint? Ivy nodded. In my room, upstairs. She pointed to a window. Is your mom inside? Bean asked. I guess, said Ivy. Is she going to tell my mom where I am? Grown-ups stuck together that way. Bean's dad said it was because they were all in a club together, but Bean felt pretty sure he was making that up. Ivy tapped her wand against her hand. Maybe we should sneak in, just to be sure. That was fine with Bean. She loved sneaking. She loved face paint, too. And she was really going to love watching Nancy kick her legs and wave her arms for the rest of her life. They went in the back door to the kitchen. Bean could hear Ivy's mom talking on the telephone somewhere in the house. This is going to be easy, whispered Ivy. She's working. She yelled loudly. Hi, Mom. Can I have a banana? Hang on a second, Bean heard Ivy's mom say. Then, to Ivy, she said, Honey, I'm on the phone. Get your own banana. There was the sound of a door shutting. Okay, yelled Ivy. She smiled at Bean. See? Very tricky, thought Bean. Ivy was turning out to be a lot more interesting than she had expected. 
They walked softly past Ivy's mom's door and up the stairs. They were very quiet. At the top of the stairs, there was a door with a sign that said, Beware, in red glitter glue letters. That was Ivy's room. When she went in, Bean stood still and looked all around. This is way, way cool, she said. She had never seen a room like Ivy's. There were thick lines drawn on the floor, marking out five sections. Each section was like a different room. In one section, there was a small sofa on a rug and a bookcase stuffed with books. In another was a table covered with pens and paper and glitter glue and paint. Ivy's bed, with a canopy made of silver netting, was in another. A dresser and a folding screen painted with clouds were in the fourth section. The fifth section had nothing in it except dolls. Bean had never seen so many dolls in her life. There were the regular plastic kind of dolls. There were the weird staring dolls with fancy costumes that were kept in glass cases at the toy store. There were stiff wooden dolls. There were china dolls, small ones, smaller ones, and tiny ones. There was one doll that was really a rock dressed in clothes. All the dolls were seated around a doll-sized blanket. Even the mushy baby dolls that couldn't sit by themselves had been propped up with blocks. In the middle of the blanket lay a Barbie doll, wrapped up in toilet paper. All the other dolls were watching her. Neat, said Bean, a mummy. Yeah, said Ivy, I'm going to build a pyramid to bury her in, as soon as I figure out how. I know how, said Bean. Nancy made one out of sugar cubes last year. I can't believe your parents let you draw lines on your floor. It's only chalk, said Ivy. It comes off. I change the lines when I change the rooms. For now, I'm thinking about getting rid of the dressing room and making it into a kitchen. Is that one the dressing room? Asked Bean, pointing to the section with the dresser and the folding screen. Yeah. I like the screen, said Bean, but a kitchen is a little bit boring. Maybe you could turn it into a science lab for making potions. The screen could protect your secrets. A lab, said Ivy, thinking. A witch's lab. That's a pretty good idea. Bean looked over to the table with the paint and the glitter glue. What's that room called? She asked. That's my art studio, said Ivy. Cool, said Bean. Let's fix up your wand. In Ivy's art studio, there were plenty of sequins and jewels and streamers and pipe cleaners. First, they wrapped the wand with silver pipe cleaners. Then, Bean attached streamers to the end. Then Ivy put some stickers on. Then Bean put plain glue on the top and dipped it in a jar of glitter. She stuck a big red jewel on the top. The wand dripped a little, but it looked much, much more magic than it had before. Now, said Bean when that was done, let's work on your robe. What's the matter with it? asked Ivy. All the stars and moons are coming off. See? Bean pointed. It will look better if we draw them on with sparkly markers. Ivy looked embarrassed. I can't draw stars very well. I can, said Bean. I'll teach you. Bean showed Ivy how to draw dots for the star points, then connect the dots with lines. Ivy practiced on paper for a while, and then they stretched the bathrobe over the table and began drawing. Ivy's stars were a little bent, but they all had five points. Soon the black robe was covered with silver stars and gold moons. Once that was done, Ivy got out her face paint. Bean couldn't believe it. The set had 24 colors. Wow, let's do green stripes, 
said Bean, or green dots? There were three different greens. No, witches are only green in movies, said Ivy. Real witches are just regular colored. But you've got all this great face paint, said Bean. We've got to use it for something. Ivy thought. You can put black around my eyes. Okay, but aren't real witches kind of pale because they go out mostly at night? Asked Bean. I guess, said Ivy. Kind of pale, but not green. My mom knew a guy who turned green. It was because he watched TV all the time, said Bean. But she could tell that she wasn't changing Ivy's mind. What if we did all white with black around your eyes, she suggested. Yeah, Ivy nodded, with a couple of blobs of red on my cheeks for blood. That's good, Bean agreed. Blood is good. So Bean carefully smeared white all over Ivy's face, except her lips. Then she drew red drops down her cheeks. They didn't really look like blood. They looked more like red tears. But that was a pretty scary thing, too. Then Bean drew thick black lines around Ivy's eyes. Both girls thought that witches' hats were dorky, so they wrapped Ivy's head in a black scarf borrowed from her mother's dresser drawer. It looked almost like long black hair. Ivy stared at herself in the dressing room mirror. Wow, she said. I look really strange. And she did. Easy peasy. Now they were ready to begin. Ivy went to the bedroom section of her room and pulled a cardboard box out from under her bed. Then she looked at Bean. This part is really secret, she said. I promise I won't tell anyone, said Bean. Ivy opened the box and took out a square thing wrapped in pink silky cloth. It was her spell book. Bean thought that a spell book would be mysterious looking, with a magic sign on the cover or something. But this spell book was plain black. It was old, though. Ivy said it was almost a hundred years old. The pages were yellowish. Where do you get it? Bean whispered. My aunt gave it to me, Ivy said. Is she one? asked Bean. She says she isn't said Ivy, but I'm not so sure. Ivy flipped through the book for the dancing spell. She read it to herself, and then she whispered it, but so low that Bean couldn't hear. Bean didn't mind. Everyone knew that witches' spells were private. After a few minutes, Ivy said, Got it. It's a pretty easy spell. The only thing we need is worms. Luckily, there were lots of worms in Bean's backyard. Tons. But now they were going to have to sneak into Bean's yard and dig them up, without Nancy seeing. But also luckily, Bean knew how to get into her yard by going through the other backyards on Pancake Court. There was one really gross dog poopy yard, and there was Mrs. Trance, who didn't like kids in her garden. And there was a lot of climbing. But aside from that, Bean said, it was easy peasy. Ivy put the big black book in her backpack. Bean tucked the wand into her back pocket. It was still a little drippy, but there was nothing Bean could do about that. Carefully, they tiptoed down the stairs. Ivy's mother was still working in her office, and they slipped past her door like quiet ants. Soon they were moving quickly toward the back fence. Ivy, Bean saw, did not really know how to climb a fence. She just jumped at it, hoping that she would get to the top. 
Bean showed her how to find the little holes and bumps that make a ladder. When they got to the top, Bean whispered, this is Ruby and Trevor's house. They have a good sandbox. The good news was that there was a gate on the other side of Ruby and Trevor's yard. The bad news was that it led to the really gross dog poopy yard. Bean and Ivy walked on tiptoes, but still Ivy stepped in some. Fester, the dog whose poop it was, came out to sniff them. He was a nice dog, and he seemed sorry that his yard was so disgusting. The next fence was low and easy, except that the wand fell out of Bean's pocket, and she had to go back and get it. Then came Jake the teenager's house. There was loud music with lots of bad words in it coming from the garage. There was no way Jake the teenager was ever going to hear them walking through his backyard. Mrs. Trance was next. Getting into her yard was no problem. Ivy and Bean climbed over the stone wall and dropped down onto her lawn. Everything in Mrs. Trance's yard was perfectly neat. Her tulips were lined up in rows. Her apple tree was tied so that its branches grew flat. Her bird bath had no birds in it. If Mrs. Trance sees us, she's going to be really mad, said Bean. Bean knew this garden. It was very long, and there was no way to go around it. Is she going to throw rocks at us? Asked Ivy. She looked a little scared. No, she just talks, but it's worse than throwing rocks, Bean sighed. Maybe she's not home. But Mrs. Trance was home. They were halfway across her perfect yard when she came outside. She stood on her patio and glared at them. Bernice, she said in a high voice, come here. Bean took a few steps toward the patio. Closer, please, Bernice. It seems that we need to have another one of our little talks. Ivy came and stood beside Bean next to the patio. Who are you? said Mrs. Trance, frowning at Ivy's white witch face. My name is Ivy, said Ivy. Well, Ivy. Children are not allowed in my garden. Maybe you can teach your friend Bernice that. Mrs. Trance gave a short, dry laugh. Because Bernice does not seem to be able to remember it by herself. Do you, Bernice? I remember, Mrs. Trance, but it was just sort of an emergency, said Bean. I'm sorry. Usually when you say you're sorry, people say something nice back to you. Not Mrs. Trance. She said, I don't think you're sorry, Bernice. If you were sorry, you wouldn't keep coming into my garden when I have asked you not to. Do I need to call your mother again? She smiled in an unfriendly way. Bean heard Ivy sucking in her breath. She's about to do something thought Bean. I'm going to throw up, Ivy said loudly. Yuck, thought Bean, whirling around to see. Ivy looked at her and crossed one eye a tiny bit. Bean looked closely at Ivy. Then she said, that's the emergency I was telling you about, Mrs. Trance. Mrs. Trance looked worried. Ivy burped. It sounded horrible. Mrs. Trance jumped back. Go, go home, run. That's what we were trying to do, Mrs. Trance, Bean said sweetly. She was having a good time watching Mrs. Trance's face. Go, now, yelled Mrs. Trance. Ivy gagged. Mrs. Trance ran inside her house and looked at them through a window. She waggled her hand to shoo them away. We'll be going now, Mrs. Trance, called Bean. She waved goodbye as she and Ivy walked away. Ivy gave one more disgusting burp, just for fun. 
Bean tried to hold her laughs in, but they came out her nose. And then Ivy couldn't hold her laughs in either. It was a good thing they were in the next yard by then. It really was easy peasy after that. They went across Callia's yard. Callia was in her high chair at the kitchen window. She waved her spoon at Bean. Bean waved back and then put her finger to her lips. Shh, she whispered. Finally, they came to Bean's own yard. Bean's Backyard You peek over, see if Nancy's there, said Bean. She might be in the yard looking for me. Ivy nodded and stood up. She could just see over the fence. I don't see anyone, she said. Then they're probably out looking for me, said Bean. She pictured her mom and Nancy with worried faces. I've been gone for a long time. Let's go get the worms, said Ivy, pulling herself over the fence. Bean's backyard was a big rectangle. There was a nice part with flowers and neat grass. And then there was a messy part with lumpy grass and a trampoline and a playhouse that Bean had had since she was little. She could barely fit inside it anymore. There was stuff lying all over the messy part. Hula hoops, balls, arrows, shovels, buckets, and a broken stilt. Bean had really hurt herself that time. The worms were in the messy part, over next to the playhouse, where the ground was wet. Ivy and Bean grabbed shovels and a bucket and got to work. At first, there was just a lot of mud. Then there was mud and a few worms. But the more they dug, the more worms they found. Six, ten, thirteen worms. The worms oozed and curled through the mud. Bean liked the way they were fat one second and stretched out and skinny the next. She and Ivy dug deeper and deeper until they had made a big muddy pit in the ground. It was almost two feet across and water dribbled down the sides. Worms were squirming at the bottom of the pit, trying to get away. Bean felt a little sorry for them, but Ivy just picked them up and dumped them into the bucket. Bean thought of Nancy kicking and waggling, and she began dumping them into the bucket too. How many do we need? asked Bean. The worms were piled on top of one another on the bottom of the bucket. Ivy looked. Only ten, but the more worms we have, the harder she'll dance. This is enough, said Bean. Poor worms. All right, said Ivy. She looked toward Bean's house. Let's go see if your sister is home. Okay, but we'd better sneak, said Bean. Bean's house was good for sneaking. At the back, there was a porch. If you crawled like a bug across the porch, you could look through a big window into the kitchen. The girls ran toward the bushes that grew next to Bean's porch and ducked down, hiding. Quietly, they began to creep up the stairs that led to the porch. Very quietly, they crawled across the floor. And then, Bean heard a sound. She froze. There it was again. A sob. It was someone crying. Bean listened. It sounded like Nancy. Bean put her hand on Ivy's arm and pointed to the window. They crawled to it and peered in like spies. There was Nancy. She was sitting at the kitchen table. She was alone. She was crying. Bean got a funny feeling. Nancy was usually so bossy, so nosy, so sure she was right. It was weird to see her cry all alone. Maybe she's crying because she thinks you're lost, whispered Ivy. 
that's kind of nice. Bean didn't answer. She had never thought she could make Nancy cry. Bean felt a lump in her throat. She remembered that Nancy let her snuggle into her bed when she had bad dreams about the spooky man. She remembered that Nancy let her play with her glass animals sometimes, even after she had broken the starfish. She remembered that Nancy had once bought her a fairy coloring book with her own money. Bean looked at the tears rolling down Nancy's cheeks. Poor Nancy. Bean sniffed. Maybe she didn't want to put the dancing spell on her sister after all. Nancy said something. Bean couldn't hear it, but she was sure it was something about missing her. What? said Bean's mother's voice from another room. Everybody has them, Nancy shouted. Everybody but me. I'm the only one who has to wait. She began to cry harder. What? Bean pressed her face against the window. Her mother's voice said, We've talked about this a million times. You can have them when you're 12. Even some of stupid Bean's friends have them, yelled Nancy. Suddenly, Bean knew what Nancy was crying about. She's not sad about me at all. She's crying about pierced ears, hissed Bean to Ivy. Bean got mad, really mad. She was even madder than she had been when Nancy tried to drag her into the house. Bean was so mad, she forgot all about being sneaky. She stood up and banged on the window with her fist. You're a big turkey, she yelled. Nancy stared and then jumped up. Hey, hey, mom, Bean's back. Get in here, Bean Breath. She flashed out the back door before Bean could even begin to run. In two seconds flat, she had Bean by the arm and was pulling her in the door. Just wait till mom gets hold of you, she was saying. You're going to be in so, so, so much trouble. Stop, yelled Ivy. She stood in front of Nancy, waving the wand at her face. I command you to free Bean. The Spell Nancy stopped dragging Bean across the porch and looked at Ivy. Who are you? She asked. Ivy smiled and slitted her eyes. With her white face and red blood drops, she looked very witchy. It matters not. Free my friend, she hissed. Wow, thought Bean. She's really going for it. Nancy dropped Bean's arm and lifted one eyebrow, which was something she had just learned how to do and did all the time. What's that supposed to be? She asked in a snippy grown-up way, looking at Ivy's wand. Ivy shook the wand in Nancy's face. This is your doom, she said in a deep voice. It's a wand, said Bean, looking back and forth between Ivy and Nancy. She was beginning to worry. Maybe Ivy was going for it too much. With older sisters, you had to be able to say that you never meant what you said, that you were kidding the whole time. Ivy didn't seem to know that. Nancy snorted. It's a stick, she said. She looked at Ivy's robe and giggled. Nice bathrobe, too. You guys are complete and total dweebs. Uh-oh. Bean looked at Ivy. Her cheeks were red under the white paint, and her eyes glittered. She looked like she might cry. Suddenly, Bean was furious. Before, she had been really mad. But now Nancy was making fun of Ivy, and that made Bean furious. Without even stopping to think about it, Bean reached down into the bucket she was still carrying. She got a big handful of pink worms. For a second, they squiggled in her hand. 
And then she threw them at Nancy's face. Some of them fell onto Nancy's shirt. Some of them got stuck in her hair. But one landed on her eyebrow and wiggled there, trying to find some dirt. Nancy was so surprised, she froze. She just stood with her mouth hanging open, staring at Bean. Calmly, Bean reached into the bucket again and got another handful of worms. She aimed better this time. She got one in Nancy's mouth. Foo! The pink worm went flying as Nancy spit it out. There was a tiny moment of quiet. And then she opened her mouth wide and let out a giant scream. Bean and Ivy looked at each other and smiled. Whatever happens next, their eyes said, that was worth it. And then they began to run. Nancy tore after them, still screaming. Bean zigzagged across the lawn because she knew it was harder to catch someone who was zigzagging. Ivy zigzagged too, right behind Bean. Worms, worms, Nancy was screaming. She had lost her mind. Ah! Bean could hear her mother calling. What on earth? Girls, girls. Bean and Ivy ran around the trampoline with Nancy close behind. They jumped over the hula hoops and the stilt and headed for the trees. Nancy followed, still screaming. She was right behind them. She was so close, she could almost grab the soft folds of Ivy's robe. She was just about to get it. Help, squealed Ivy. Bean gave a yank and pulled the robe away in the nick of time. Ivy and Bean swerved for the playhouse. Maybe they could get inside it before Nancy tackled them. Come on, Bean yelled. Together, they jumped over the worm pit, squeezed into the playhouse, and slammed the door. Woo, they said together. Then, it happened. Nancy was still chasing them. She was running toward the playhouse and toward the worm pit. The big, muddy worm pit. Bean and Ivy knew it was there, but Nancy didn't and she didn't see it. She charged toward the playhouse and, whoops, her foot landed on the side of the muddy pit. Ivy and Bean looked out the playhouse window and they saw Nancy skidding on the slimy edge of the hole. Back and forth, she wobbled, trying to keep her balance. She kicked out one foot. She waved her arms wildly. She kicked out her other foot. She waved, she kicked, it was perfect. She's dancing, yelled Bean. The spell worked, yelled Ivy. And just at that moment, with a sloppy, gloppy thud, Nancy slipped off the edge and landed in the muddy goo at the bottom of the worm pit. No dessert. No dessert, said Bean, no videos for a week. But at least they didn't make me stay in my room. Ivy was sitting next to Bean on her front porch. It was almost dark. They watched the bugs flying around the streetlight. I don't think they're really mad, said Ivy. You don't? They had seemed pretty mad to Bean. They have to act mad so they'll seem fair to your sister, Ivy said. But your mom had this little teeny smile on her face when she pulled Nancy out of the pit. She thought it was funny. Bean smiled too, remembering. It was funny. It was great. Nancy says she's never going to speak to either of us ever again and she took back the coloring book she gave me. Well, she never spoke to me before today, so that won't be any different for me. It'll be better for me, but I bet she doesn't stick to it. 
Bean yawned. It had been a big day. She turned to Ivy. Do you think the spell is what made her dance? Of course. Ivy sounded very sure. But after a minute, she said, I didn't have time to say the spell, really. I just sort of thought it at the last second. Bean stared into the shadowy yard. Maybe that's why she didn't dance for very long, because you only thought the spell instead of saying it. Next time I'll say it. You're going to do it again? On who? Bean asked. I was thinking about that Mrs. Trance, said Ivy. Bean pictured Mrs. Trance kicking up her feet on the edge of a muddy pit. It would be a beautiful sight. Can you teach me to burp like that? Asked Bean. Sure, Ivy said. Maybe I'll try something new on Mrs. Trance, like a storm of grasshoppers. Is that a hard one? No, but we have to start with a lot of grasshoppers, said Ivy. It seems like all the spells have bugs in them, said Bean. Not all of them, said Ivy. Potions don't. Potions. That sounded fun. Let's make a potion, Bean said. Okay, Ivy said. Tomorrow, we'll make potions. I know what, said Bean. Tomorrow, let's fix up a lab in your room. Then we can make potions. She pictured a lab with shelves full of little bottles. She and Ivy would wear goggles. Ivy sat up straighter. Yeah, that'll be good. We'll dump the dressing room and get some shelves. Shelves with little bottles and maybe a counter. Bean? Bean's mother came out onto the front porch. There you are. It's almost bath time. Ivy... Do you want me to walk you home? Okay, said Ivy. But Bean's mom sat down beside Bean and looked at the nighttime sky. You girls have certainly had a big day, haven't you? Bean leaned against her mother's arm. Tomorrow we're going to make a lab in Ivy's room. You are, are you? said Bean's mom. What for? Potions said Ivy. What kind of potions? asked Bean's mom. Secret potions, said Ivy. There was a silence. Then Bean's mom said, no matches, no poison, no explosions, no deadly fumes, no bugging Nancy. Is that clear? Ivy and Bean looked at each other and rolled their eyes. Weren't you the one who was always telling me to play with her, said Bean. Wasn't this all your idea in the first place? Bean's mother smiled at them in the dark. The light on Ivy's porch came on, and Ivy's mom stepped out the door. She waved across the street. Time to come in, honey. Down the stairs and across the circle, she came in the moonlight. Ivy stood up. So did Bean. See you tomorrow. See you tomorrow. And the day after that, Bean added in her mind. Ivy, holding her mother's hand in the middle of the street, turned around to look at Bean. And the day after that, she said. The End You've been listening to Ivy and Bean by Annie Barrows, narrated by Cassandra Morris, and directed by Claudia Howard. This book is copyrighted 2006 by Annie Barrows. This recording is copyrighted 2007 by Recorded Books. If you've enjoyed this book and this performance, Recorded Books recommends Beetle McGrady Eats Bugs by Megan MacDonald. 
narrated by Jessica Almacy. Beetle McGrady dreams of being an explorer like Marco Polo, or a pioneer like Amelia Earhart. She dreams of being brave and daring, and she's going to begin by eating an ant. It's a dare, double dare, on the school playground. But will Beetle be able to live up to her dreams? And if she doesn't, does that mean she's a chicken? You'll find a wide selection of titles in the Recorded Books catalog, including bestsellers, mysteries, classics, histories, and more. Call us toll-free or log on to www.recordedbooks.com to learn about our latest releases and special offers, order another recorded book, or to read author interviews and narrator profiles. Don't forget to ask about easy 30-day rentals by mail. And thank you for being a Recorded Books reader. Recorded Books presents an unabridged recording of Ivy and Bean and the Ghost That Had to Go by Annie Barrows Narrated by Cassandra Morris and directed by Ethan Abbott Gamash The Gymnastics Club One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, wham! Bean crashed into the grass. Ouch, said Ivy, peeking through a hole in her sandwich. Doesn't that hurt? No, I'm just dizzy, said Bean. She sat up, and the playground began to tilt. Ugh, she lay down again. Now Emma stood up. She lifted her hands above her head, took a big breath, and began. She did nine good cartwheels before she fell on her head. Are you all right? Ivy asked Emma with her mouth full of peanut butter. Sort of, said Emma. Now it was Zuzu's turn. Zuzu was the best cartwheeler in the gymnastics club. She was also the best backbender. She could do seven round-offs in a row. Nobody else could do even one. Zuzu pulled down her ruffled pink shirt and raised her hands. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve cartwheels. And still Zuzu landed on her feet. Then she arched over backward. She flung her arms over her head and made a perfect backbend. She looked like a turned over pink teacup. Then she rose back up, boing, like a doll with elastic in its legs. Wow, said Ivy. Bean jumped up. She just had to do 12 cartwheels. Stand back, she yelled. Wait, said Zuzu. What about Ivy? Aren't you going to do a cartwheel, Ivy? I'm guarding the jackets, said Ivy. But Ivy, this is the gymnastics club, said Zuzu. You can't just guard jackets. Why not, Ivy wondered. We'll teach you how to do it if you don't know, said Emma. She knows, said Bean. She could do a cartwheel. I've seen her. Ivy looked at Bean in surprise. Why was she saying that? Ivy had never done a cartwheel in her life. Slowly, Ivy put her sandwich down next to Emma's jacket. There's just one little problem, she began. Hey, Leo, yelled Bean suddenly. You'd better watch out. If I get hit with that ball, there's going to be trouble. Leo was the leader of the soccer kids at Emerson School. Before there was a gymnastics club, the soccer kids had the whole field to themselves during lunch recess. When Bean and Emma and Zuzu and Ivy started the gymnastics club, 
they kept getting hit with soccer balls. One day, Bean got clobbered in the stomach, and she declared war on the soccer kids. She came to school with a bag of ripe plums and chased Leo down. When she caught him, she sat on him and rubbed plums into his hair. Rose, the yard duty, had been really mad. She told Leo and Bean that they had to work it out or she would kick them all off the field. So Bean and Leo worked it out. The gymnastics club was supposed to have all the grass near the play structure. The soccer kids were supposed to keep their balls from hitting the gymnastics club. Bean promised not to bring plums to school anymore. After that, the war was mostly over. But now, Leo looked mad. It's not even near you, he yelled. He was right. The ball was on the other side of the field, near McAdam, a weird kid who sat under the trees and ate dirt when he thought no one was looking. Okay, yelled Bean, feeling like a dork. She had only been trying to help Ivy. Like I was saying, I can't do a cartwheel at the moment, said Ivy. Why? asked Zuzu with her hands on her hips. Because, Ivy said, we've got an emergency situation going on right over there, she pointed. Emma, Zuzu, and Bean followed Ivy's pointing finger across the playground. She was pointing directly to the girls' bathroom, the one right outside their classroom. The Oath of Liquids What? said Emma. What? said Zuzu. You don't see it? said Ivy. What are you talking about? asked Emma. Bean didn't say anything. She was watching Ivy. What was going on? I see a bathroom. I don't see any emergency situation, said Zuzu. She patted the little pink bow in her hair. Ivy stopped pointing and sighed. Oh, well, you probably wouldn't believe me anyway. I'd believe you, said Bean. Anyway, you have to tell me because of the oath. Two Saturdays before, Ivy had told Bean about blood oaths. If you write down a promise and sign it with your own blood, then you have to keep the promise always. If you didn't, the blood inside your body would curdle. Bean didn't know what curdling was, so Ivy explained that it was like cottage cheese. How disgusting was that? Bean was ready to give it a try right away. But first, they had to think of an oath. Bean wanted the oath to be about turning her older sister Nancy to stone. Maybe not forever, but for a month at least. Ivy said no. It had to be something they could do for sure. In the end, they promised to tell each other all their secrets for the rest of their lives. Ivy wrote the words down with a silver marker. It looked very fancy. The problem was that the oath had to be signed at midnight. They tried for three days. Ivy tried staying awake until midnight. Bean tried waking herself up at midnight. They both tried sleeping on the floor so that they would be really uncomfortable and wake up. Nothing worked. Ivy said it would be almost the same if they did it at the stroke of noon. The two girls squished into Bean's old playhouse, and Ivy read the oath in a very serious voice. Then she got out a pin. She held it right above her finger, ready to stab herself, almost ready to stab herself. 
Blood attracts vampire bats, she said suddenly. Vampire bats, said Bean. Yeah, vampire bats. They drink blood. Mostly they drink cow blood, but they might get attracted to us if we sign the oath with blood. She put the pin down. Bean understood. Poking your finger with a pin didn't seem like a big deal until you were about to do it. She didn't really want to poke her own finger either. But they both felt disappointed. A blood oath had been such a great idea. Why does it have to be blood? Asked Bean. Why couldn't it be something else from inside us? Like what? Ivy looked interested. Boogers? Yuck, said Bean. No. What about spit? Ivy said, spit would be all right, I guess. I don't want my spit to curdle either. Bean and Ivy never got much chance to spit because their mothers didn't like it. So they each made a big one, and gushed it around into letters. They had more spit than they knew what to do with. The paper tore in one place, and you couldn't really see their names when it dried. That just makes it more mysterious, Bean said. It's an oath of liquids, said Ivy. A powerful oath. So now, Ivy had to tell her secret to Bean. Excuse me, said Ivy politely to Emma and Zuzu. She pulled Bean a few steps away. This morning, whispered Ivy, when I went to the bathroom, I got a funny feeling, like I was walking through a cold mist. And even though it was warm, I began to shiver. My teeth were chattering, like this. Ivy smacked her teeth together. And then I heard this strange whining noise, like this. Ivy squealed with her mouth closed. Bean didn't know what she was talking about. Was it someone locked in a stall, she guessed. No, don't you get it? Ivy's eyes glowed. Get what? It's a ghost. The bathroom is haunted, Ivy whisper shouted. Bean spun around to look at the school. The long open breezeway was dotted with blue doors. The first and second grade girls' bathroom was in the middle of the breezeway. Bean could see a girl coming out of the bathroom door right now. Look! Ivy grabbed her arm. See the cloudy stuff right next to that girl's head? See? Bean squinted. The more she squinted, the more she could see a pale, milky cloud floating on the side of the bathroom door. The girl... Stepping out into the breezeway, rubbed her arms. See? Ivy squeaked. See? She's cold because she just walked through a ghost. And then, Bean could see it clearly. The pale spot grew thicker until it was a patch of fog about the size of a person. You couldn't see through it to the inside of the bathroom. I can see it, whispered Bean. Does it have yellowish eyes, like little flashlights? Yes, Ivy whispered, squeezing Bean's arm. Yes, it does. They looked at each other and smiled. This was even better than a blood oath. How totally cool, shouted Bean. A haunted bathroom in her own school. What's cool? yelled Emma and Zuzu together. Tell us! But at that minute, 
the bell rang. Lunch was over. We'll tell, said Ivy, right here, after school. You're going to love it, said Bean. Who's that ugly guy? Even before Ivy and Bean were friends, they had both been in Ms. Aruba Tate's second grade class. They didn't sit together, but after the day they threw worms at Bean's sister Nancy, they asked Ms. Aruba Tate if they could share a table. Ms. Aruba Tate just loved it when people were friends. She smiled and said, That's wonderful, girls. The two of you will be a great team. After a minute, though, she added, But if there's talking, I'm going to have to separate you. So far, Ivy and Bean had been separated six times. This was not a big surprise. Bean had been separated from everyone in the class at least once. No matter who she sat next to, Bean talked. Even McAdam, who mostly talked to himself, had to be separated from Bean. Once, Ms. Aruba Tate had Bean sit by herself, but Bean just talked louder. Bean tried not to talk. She promised not to talk. But every day, she talked. Mostly, she was trying to be helpful. She was trying to explain things to kids who didn't understand. For example, regrouping. Eric didn't understand regrouping. Ms. Aruba Tate had explained it, but he didn't understand it. So he added instead of subtracting. Bean couldn't stand to watch him add when she knew he was supposed to subtract. Just knowing that he was adding made it impossible for her to do her own subtraction. She had to tell him that he was doing it wrong. She had to tell him how to do it right. Bean is only responsible for Bean, Ms. Aruba Tate kept saying. But Bean thought that wasn't true, because Ms. Aruba Tate also kept saying that a class was like a family, and families were responsible for each other. When Bean pointed this out, Ms. Aruba Tate opened her mouth and then closed it again. Ivy was very quiet. She was the quietest kid in the class. So Ms. Aruba Tate kept putting Bean back with Ivy. I think she hopes it will rub off on me, Bean explained to her mom. But so far, it hasn't. Even though she hadn't learned how to be quiet, Bean had learned a lot by sitting next to Ivy. One thing she had learned was that Ivy wasn't as quiet as she seemed. Ivy talked. She just talked so softly that no one could hear her. After lunch, the second graders had science. They were doing a unit on dinosaurs. Bean's favorites were the ones that had big, bony skulls that cracked together when they fought. Ivy liked the bird dinosaurs with feathers and sharp claws and red eyeballs. Today, the second graders were learning about swimming dinosaurs. Actually, they weren't dinosaurs at all. Ms. Aruba Tate was saying, These prehistoric creatures are called marine reptiles. One marine reptile is... Pteranodon! Eric hollered, waving his arm in the air. Plesiosaur, breathed Ivy so only Bean could hear her. Plesiosaur, said Bean out loud. I like the way that Emma is raising her hand. Emma, said Ms. Aruba Tate. Emma stared at her. Um, I forget. Ms. Aruba Tate said, Bean, will you repeat what you said? Plesiosaur, said Bean. Ivy said it really.
Thank you, Ivy and Bean, said Ms. Rubitate. Then she held up a picture of something that looked like a whale and a giraffe glued together. Who's that ugly guy? Doucet shouted. Then he laughed so hard that he fell out of his chair. Doucet, will you please go sit on the rug? Said Ms. Rubitate. Do sit, do sit, hollered Eric. He fell out of his chair, too. Ms. Tate put the picture down in her lap. Class, if you can't make more mature decisions, I will have to put our marine reptile materials away, she said. Is that what I should do? No, the second grade muttered feeling ashamed. They loved marine reptiles, and they loved Ms. Aruba Tate. Ms. Aruba Tate smiled. She held up the picture. Now, the largest of the plesiosaurs was the elasmosaur. As you can see in this picture, it had an extremely long neck. Does anyone have a theory about why such a long neck would be useful? You could wrap it around somebody's body and squeeze them until they were dead, yelled Drew. Like this. He put his arm around Vanessa's neck and began to squeeze. Drew, stop that. I wasn't going to do it for real. I was just showing. Bean raised her hand. Maybe they could reach up out of the water and eat birds or something. That's an interesting theory, Bean, said Ms. Tate. Does anyone else have a theory? Other way around, Ivy murmured. What? said Bean. They reached down under the water, breathed Ivy. Ivy has a theory, Ms. Tate said Bean. Do you want to share it with the rest of us, Ivy? Asked Ms. Rubitate. The elasmosaur probably used its long neck to go down to the seafloor and eat stuff there, said Ivy softly. Very good thinking, you two, Ms. Rubitate smiled. And Drew, your theory may be correct as well. Please leave Vanessa alone. But unfortunately, we have no way of proving these theories one way or the other, since the elasmosaur is... What's the word, boys and girls? Extinct, they hollered. Except for the Loch Ness Monster, said Ivy softly. Yes, Ivy? said Ms. Rubitate. Can you name another type of marine reptile? Ah, uh, said Ivy. She was stuck. Ms. Rubitate probably didn't believe in the Loch Ness Monster. Ivy couldn't think of any other marine reptiles. I said, can I go to the bathroom? Oh, said Ms. Rubitate. Go along. After the door had closed behind Ivy, Bean waved her hand in the air. Ms. Rubitate, I have to go too. Are you sure, Bean? Asked Ms. Rubitate. Yes, bad. Bean held her breath, trying to turn her face red. If your face was red, Ms. Rubitate usually let you go. Ms. Rubitate still looked doubtful. Go on then, but come back ASAP. ASAP was Ms. Tate's word for fast. The Portal Ivy was standing outside the bathroom door. She was staring at the ground. What you looking at? asked Bean. Portal, said Ivy pointing to a whitish stain on the cement. What? It's a portal, a door, to the underworld. 
This is where the ghost is coming in. Ivy kneeled down to touch the stain. Bean felt a little shiver on the back of her head. A haunted bathroom was cool, but a door to the underworld was creepy. The stain did kind of look like a ghost. She didn't feel so excited about the ghost anymore. Why would a ghost come to our bathroom anyway? She asked, kneeling beside Ivy. The school was probably built on top of graves, said Ivy. When they do that, it disturbs the spirits, so they wander around, all sad and miserable, haunting whatever was built on top of them. But it's not our fault. We didn't decide to build the school here. Ivy shook her head. Ghosts don't care. Her voice got mysterious. And now they will seek revenge on the intruders who ruined their graves. Revenge, said Bean, staring at the spot. She imagined cloudy shapes whirling down the breezeway toward Ms. Arubitate's classroom. They'll be pouring in, said Ivy, an army of ghosts. But there's just one now, right? Asked Bean quickly. Ivy jumped up. Let's find out, she said, reaching for the door. An army of ghosts? No way Bean was going in that bathroom now. Ms. Aruba Tate said we had to come back ASAP, she said. Ivy saw Bean's face. Oh, okay, she said. Let's go back. Put up your chairs, boys and girls, said Ms. Aruba Tate. She said it every afternoon when the bell rang. And every afternoon, half the class forgot. Drew, please keep your hands to yourself. McAdam, you may not put the turtle in your backpack. Thank you. Emma and Zuzu were already on the field when Ivy and Bean got there. They weren't doing cartwheels. They were just waiting. So, said Emma, tell us. Ivy explained about the milky cloud, about the girl coming out of the bathroom shivering, about the moaning noise, and about the yellow eyes that shone like flashlights. When she was done, Emma and Zuzu turned to look at the blue bathroom door. No way, said Zuzu. I don't see anything, said Emma. That's okay. Some people just can't see them, said Ivy. Bean can. Bean nodded. Some people couldn't see them, but she could. But wait, said Emma. If there's a ghost, I want to see it. She leaned forward, staring at the bathroom. Keep your eyes open for a long time without blinking, Ivy suggested. Emma popped her eyes at the door. A girl ran down the breezeway and into the bathroom. As the door swung shut, Emma said, I see a cloud. It's a milky cloud, like you said. Yeah, that's it, Ivy said, nodding. Zuzu popped her eyes too. Is it glowing? I thought I saw something glowing. That's the eyes, Bean said. You must be seeing its eyes. She felt important, helping Zuzu to see the ghost. What are you guys doing? It was Leo, with a soccer ball under his arm. Look, said Ivy, pointing. The girl was coming out of the bathroom. See how she's rubbing her hands? That's because she just walked through the cold mist. She's probably shivering, too. Leo looked at Ivy. What? There's a ghost in our bathroom, Bean explained. It's like walking through a cold mist, said Emma. And it has glowing eyes, added Zuzu. You guys are wacko, said Leo 
dropping his ball on the ground and pretending to kick it. There's a portal to the ghost world right outside the door in the cement, said Ivy to Emma and Zuzu. Bean and I found it when we went to the bathroom. Come on, I'll show it to you. A portal? said Emma. What's a portal? It's a doorway to the underworld, Bean explained. Oh, Emma stood still. Bean understood how she felt. We're not going in, she explained. We're just looking at the portal. It will be totally safe, said Ivy. Bean knew that Ivy thought almost anything was safe. Okay, said Emma. Zuzu nodded. They started across the playground. Leo followed along, kicking the ball as he went. Zuzu spills the beans. The next day at lunch recess, there were no gymnastics on the grass. No soccer either. Every second grader in the school gathered around the play structure, watching the bathroom. Whenever someone went in, they could see the ghost inside. It had definitely become clearer during the night. Pretty soon, nobody went in. Everyone knew about the ghost, even the kindergartners, and nobody wanted to use a haunted bathroom. Still, the second graders kept watching the door, just in case an army of ghosts floated out. What are you kids doing? yelled Rose the yard duty. We're just standing here, Bean yelled back. It's a free country. You watch it, Miss Bean, warned Rose, but she went away. The ghost didn't start causing problems until that afternoon. It was right in the middle of drop everything and read when Ms. Arubitate's classroom door burst open. Mrs. Noble marched in, holding Zuzu by the shoulder. Mrs. Noble was a fifth grade teacher. She had a thousand tiny wrinkles on her face. And she wore high heels and stockings every day. Bean's mother said that Mrs. Noble was an old-fashioned teacher. Bean's sister, Nancy, said that Mrs. Noble locked kids in her art cupboard when they were bad. Bean's mother said that Nancy was exaggerating. That was a nice way to say lying. Bean put her book down. She didn't like drop everything and read anyway, except for the beginning, when she got to drop things. Mrs. Noble's high heels were red with stiff black bows at the front, and her shiny red fingernails were pressed into Zuzu's shoulder. Zuzu was about to cry. This was going to be much more interesting than a book. Mrs. Noble didn't bother to lower her voice. Becky, she boomed, you've got to keep an eye on them. I found this one all the way over in the upper school bathroom. Ms. Aruba Tate looked worried. What were you doing in the upper school bathroom, honey? Zuzu opened her mouth, but no sound came out. Big tears dripped down her cheeks and fell on the floor. Our bathroom's haunted, she wailed suddenly. Oh, brother. Bean looked sideways at Ivy. Trouble. Ivy was staring at Zuzu. Then Zuzu pointed right at Ivy and Bean. They, they, they saw a ghost in the bathroom, and it's mad because the school's on top of its grave, and there's a portal, and more ghosts are coming, she gasped. Ivy slid down in her chair until she could hardly see over the desktop. Ms. Aruba Tate put her arms around Zuzu. Honey, the bathroom's not haunted. Oh, yes, it is, hollered Eric. I saw him, yelled Doucet. He's got yellow glowing eyes, Ms. Aruba Tate. 
said Vanessa. Ivy says. Ivy looked at the classroom door. If she ran for it, would Ms. Arubitate catch her before she got out? Ms. Arubitate turned to Ivy. Is all this coming from you, Ivy? She sounded like she couldn't believe it. Ivy swallowed. She wished she had never seen the ghost. She wished she had never said the word ghost. All what? She said finally, in a high voice. Ms. Aruba Tate looked over the class. Boys and girls, who has heard this silly story? One by one, the hands went up until only Ivy's were in her lap. Ivy, said Ms. Aruba Tate, are you going to tell me that you have no idea what Zuzu is talking about? No, said Ivy softly, her eyes on her desk. It's not a silly story. The bathroom is haunted. Her face was burning hot. Oh boy, thought Bean. Trouble with cheese on top. Mrs. Noble shook her head. Smart Alec, she boomed. I'd send her to the principal if she were mine, Becky. Ooh, murmured the second grade. But as it turned out, Ms. Aruba Tate didn't send Ivy to the principal's office. Instead, the whole class sat in a circle on the rug while Ms. Aruba Tate talked about how important imagination was. Then, Ms. Aruba Tate told them a story about yelling fire in a crowded theater. Bean had no idea what any of it had to do with a haunted bathroom. Ivy just wanted to run away. She didn't hear anything. At least, not until Ms. Aruba Tate said, Some stories can be harmful to others, class. And that means we have to use our imaginations responsibly and respectfully. Ivy tried to scrunch down behind Bean, who was sitting next to her. Ms. Aruba Tate said, Do you understand, Ivy? Yes, whispered Ivy, not looking at Ms. Aruba Tate. The bell rang and everybody started squirming around but Ms. Aruba Tate held up her hand. So, I expect that I won't hear any more nonsense about a ghost in the bathroom, right? Everyone looked at Ivy. Ivy picked some dirt out of the rug. Right, she whispered after a moment. Put up your chairs, boys and girls, said Ms. Aruba Tate. No more nonsense. Ivy wasn't exactly crying, but her eyes were glittery. She still likes you, Bean said. Really, she does. Ivy shook her head. They were supposed to be walking home, but Ivy kept stopping. She felt too awful to walk. Why didn't you just say that the bathroom wasn't haunted? asked Bean. Grown-ups never like that kind of stuff. But it is haunted, Ivy said. And I'm the one who said it was. Okay, Bean said. But you don't have to tell them everything. I didn't think Ms. Aruba Tate would get mad at me. She's not mad at you, said Bean. She is mad at me, said Ivy in a choked voice. She hates me. No, she likes you because you know all the answers, Bean said. Ivy didn't say anything, but she started walking again. Ivy's in trouble, sang a voice behind them. B.
Bean whirled around. Why don't you just shut up, Leo? Hey, said Leo, surprised. That's mean. Go away, Bean said. She wished she had some plums. I live on this street, you doof. Leo picked up a rock and threw it at a tree. I heard you got sent to the principals, he said to Ivy. I did not, yelled Ivy. She stuck her tongue out at Leo. Jeez, said Leo. If there is a ghost, your ugly face will scare him back to his grave. Ivy stopped sticking out her tongue. Oh, she said. Bean, that's what we have to do. What, said Bean. We've got to send it back to its grave, said Ivy. We need to expel it. Expel? Like Cody? Cody had lit two garbage cans on fire and wasn't allowed to come back to school anymore. He was expelled. Yeah, like Cody, said Ivy. That'll fix everything. How are you going to expel a ghost? Leo asked. They had forgotten he was there. Secret, said Ivy and Bean at the same moment. They looked at each other and smiled. Oh, come on, said Leo. I won't tell. Can't, said Ivy as she started to walk away. Leo looked glum. Bean felt sorry for him. We'll tell you afterward. Oh, thanks, he said. Bean turned and raced to catch up with Ivy, who was halfway up the street. The Potion Solution This is going to be great, said Bean happily. She just loved potions. The two girls were in Ivy's magic lab. The magic lab was one of the five little rooms that Ivy had made inside her bedroom. Chalk lines on the floor showed where one room ended and another began. There was an art studio, a living room, a doll room, a sleeping area, and the lab. Bean's favorite was the art studio, with its little white table and the stack of bins filled with markers, glitter glue, pipe cleaners, beads, colored paper, feathers, and paint. The magic lab was Ivy's favorite. In it was a bookshelf that held a shiny black rock, four fossils, a real snakeskin, lots of bottles in all shapes and sizes, and jars of herbs and ingredients. Ivy loved to say ingredients. There was another table, which Ivy had covered in tin foil. On top was a plastic tub of water. Ivy had wanted a sink, but her mother had said no way. So Ivy filled the plastic tub in the bathroom and carried it back to her lab. It spilled a lot. Ivy took her magic book from its special hiding place and began flipping through the pages. There's got to be a potion in here somewhere, she said, frowning. Then she giggled. Here's one for making someone fall in love with you. Bean made a throwing up sound. Here's one for getting your money back after it's stolen. That's not it, said Bean, sticking her hand in the water tub. Some water spilled onto the floor. I know, said Ivy, still flipping pages. But I don't see... Here's another one for making someone fall in love with you. That's dumb. How come there's nothing for returning a ghost to its grave? There should be, said Bean. Most people don't want ghosts hanging around the house. Ivy looked up from her book. I wouldn't mind. What if it creaked open your closet door in the middle of the night? Asked Bean, and you could hear it breathing. Ivy thought. I'd talk to it. My grandma's cousin lived in a house with a ghost that whistled. 
My grandma said that when she was a girl, she always heard the ghost whistling upstairs when she went to play at her cousin's. I'd freak. Was she scared? Asked Bean. Grandma says the only thing she's scared of is chickens. But I think she's joking. I wish I'd been there, said Ivy. I would have asked it why it was haunting the house. Bean stared at her hand in the water tub. It looked ghostly. I bet ghosts are scared of themselves. It must be weird to look down and see through yourself. Ivy looked at her. Maybe. Maybe Grandma's ghost whistled because it was trying to cheer itself up. She went back to looking at her book, and the magic lab was quiet for a minute or two. Hey, she said suddenly. Here's something that could work. It's a potion that you pour in front of your house to keep evil spirits away. Bean was feeling sorry for the ghost now. But it's not an evil spirit, she argued. It just wants the school to get off its grave. The ghost was there first. First come, first served. Yeah, you're right, Ivy agreed. But the ghost has got to go, Miserubitate Tate said. And besides, we'll be doing a good deed for the ghost, in a way. Don't you think it would rather be in its grave? Bean thought. I guess so. That bathroom is nasty. Right. So here's what we'll do. Ivy leaned over the tinfoil. We'll make a ceremony. We'll tell it that we know it's not evil. We'll tell it that we just want it to rest peacefully. We'll tell it that we come as friends, Bean said, bouncing in her chair. We could chant, said Ivy. We come as friends, she chanted. We come in peace, chanted Bean. A dance might be good, too, she added. Once it goes back to its grave, we'll pour the potion around the edges of the bathroom so it can't come back, Ivy said. Sounds good, said Bean. She thought for a minute. Hey, I have an idea. You know the Egyptians? Ivy nodded. Yeah? They used to put presents in the grave with the dead person. The stuff to play with. And money. We should do that. Presents would make the ceremony even better. Presents, Ivy repeated. That's a great idea. It'll be like an ancient burial. Suddenly, she stood up. But first, we need to make the potion. Sneaky Bean. Bean! She sounds like one of those screaming monkeys, said Ivy, stirring. She looks like one too, said Bean. Do we need more rosemary? Sure, Ivy said. Put some more in. Bean, you've got to come home now, Mom says. She's too lazy to walk across the street, said Bean. My mom tells her to go get me, and she just stands on the porch and screams. She's lazy, Ivy agreed. She looked at the jars on her shelf. She had a little bit of nutmeg and a lot of seeds she had found in the backyard. She had some dead bugs. She had plenty of baking soda. The problem with making potions from her magic book was that she never had exactly the right ingredients. Sometimes she didn't even know what they were. The keeping away evil spirits potion had an ingredient called pony. Ivy didn't think they meant a real pony. She didn't have a pony anyway. I think we should put in some more baking soda, she said. Bean, you had better not make me come get you. Bean opened Ivy's window and leaned out. Nancy was standing on the porch, her face red from screaming. 
I'll be there in a minute, Bean said in her regular voice. What? Screeched Nancy. I'll be there in a minute, Bean called a little louder. There's one more thing we need, said Ivy, looking at the book again. She giggled. I can't hear you, but you'd better get over here right now or you'll be sorry. I'm already sorry about how stupid you look in those shorts, Bean bellowed. There was a tiny silence, and then Bean's front door banged shut. Nancy was going to tell their mom. Sheesh, said Bean. She's so touchy. But I guess I should go home. My mom will be mad if she has to come get me. Okay, said Ivy. I can do the rest by myself. But you have to get the last ingredient. She giggled again. It's the most important one. What is it? said Bean, looking around for her shoes. The hair of an enemy, said Ivy. A big grin spread over Bean's face. How much? Not much, Ivy said. Just a handful. They looked at each other and began to laugh. When Bean woke up, it was dark. She sat up and peered out the window. Wow, she thought. I did it. Outside, a street light shone down on a car and the empty sidewalk. Everyone was asleep. Even though she hadn't really expected to wake up in the middle of the night, Bean had placed a pair of scissors on the table beside her bed. She took hold of them, pointy end down, and began the tiptoe walk down the hall to Nancy's room. It was funny to be awake when her parents weren't. There were shadows wavering on the walls. Bean began to feel a little scared. It wasn't that she was scared she'd get caught. It was more scary not to be caught. How could her parents not know that she was up? Nancy liked her door closed at night. Bean had always thought that was weird, but now it was just plain annoying because Bean had to open the door without making a sound. Very, very slowly, she turned the knob. Quietly, quietly, she pushed the door. It gave one sharp creak and then swung open. Nancy kept her door closed, but she kept her curtain open. This was very handy, because the street light coming in the open window gave Bean enough light to see. Nancy was rolled into a ball under her blanket, and her long brown hair was spilled out over her pillow. Every once in a while, she gave a long, sniffy breath. Bean almost laughed. This was going to be easy peasy. But it wasn't as easy as she thought. Bean stood over Nancy's bed for a long time. She could have cut almost all of Nancy's hair off. It was lying right there. But Bean knew she wasn't going to do that. That would be meaner than anything she had ever done. And besides, she'd get caught. No, what Bean had to decide was whether she wanted Nancy to know her hair had been cut. If Bean took one piece and cut it way up near Nancy's head, it could be a couple of weeks before she noticed it. But then it would bug her for a long time. On the other hand... If Bean just trimmed off a little all the way across the bottom, Nancy probably wouldn't notice at all. Bean sighed softly. She should just trim it. This was what Ms. Aruba Tate called making a mature decision. 
Mature decisions were not as much fun as immature decisions, but sometimes you had to make them. Bean leaned over the pillow and began to snip very, very quietly. No such thing. Food coloring didn't change the magic of a potion. It just made it look better. Most potions, Ivy had learned, came out greenish brown. Sometimes they were pinkish brown, which was even worse. So Ivy fixed them up with food coloring. Wow, said Bean when she saw the thick blue liquid in Ivy's jar. That's really blue. How much did you put in? Almost a whole thingy. Doesn't your mom get mad when you do that? Asked Bean. But she knew the answer. Ivy's mom didn't get mad about using things up. She got mad about messes. All parents were different. Did you get the hair? Ivy asked. Yeah. Bean pulled a plastic bag out of her pocket. It's just little bits. She didn't even notice. Even though that's what Bean had wanted, she had still been disappointed. Ivy understood. Maybe she'll notice later. The two girls crouched down and carefully added the bits of hair to the jar. After they put the lid back on, they took turns shaking the jar until the hair was mixed in. Then Ivy whispered some magic words while Bean plugged her ears. Even with the oath of liquids, Bean wasn't supposed to hear Ivy's magic words. When she was done, Ivy put the jar in her backpack. The girls started walking to school. Did you bring a present for the ghost? Ivy asked. I'm going to give it my half dollar, said Bean, showing a bright silver coin. What about you? I brought one of my fossils, the shell one. That's a good present for a ghost. Fossils and ghosts were both leftovers of dead things. When the girls got to Emerson's school, Leo was waiting for them. Are you guys still going to expel the ghost? He asked. Of course. We made a potion, said Bean. Leo shook his head. You guys are nuts, he said. But then he asked, What's in it? Secret, said Bean. All we can tell you is that this potion is very powerful, said Ivy in a mysterious voice. And at lunch recess, the ghost will be expelled, never to return. Leo dropped his ball and gave it a soft kick. I'll help if you want. By morning recess, all the kids in the second grade knew that Ivy and Bean were going to expel the ghost at lunch. Everyone gathered around the play structure again. Ms. Aruba Tate said you weren't supposed to talk about the ghost anymore, Ivy, said Zuzu. She snapped the waist of her skirt. That's not what she said, Ivy said. She said she expected that she wouldn't hear any more nonsense about a ghost in the bathroom. And she's not going to, because we're going to expel it with our potion, added Bean. That's why we're doing it, said Ivy, for Ms. Aruba Tate. If it was just us, we wouldn't. We don't mind it. My uncle knows a guy who saw a ghost, and his hair turned white in one second, said Eric. Ghosts are dead, said Drew. They're going to eat your brains. Ivy and Bean rolled their eyes. That's zombies, said Bean. The ghost was here first, Ivy said, trying to be patient. The school invaded its resting place. We have to send it back to its grave, but we're going to give it presents like the Egyptians did with their dead people. It's going to be a ceremony. Zuzu snapped her waistband again and said, Well... I don't believe in ghosts, and I'm going to tell Ms. Aruba Tate what you're doing. 
she turned toward the classroom. Uh-oh, thought Bean. Trouble. Halt. It was Ivy's voice, louder than anyone but Bean had ever heard it. Zuzu halted. Ivy glared at Zuzu. You have insulted the ghost of Emerson School. The ghost is now your enemy. Zuzu's face got bright pink. No, it's not. There's no such thing as ghosts. Quickly, before Ivy could get really mad, Bean said, Don't worry, Zuzu. We're going to expel the ghost. We've got a potion. I'm not worried, Zuzu said in a high voice. But she said it was my enemy, and she's not supposed to talk about it. It's not your enemy, I promise, said Bean firmly. She was just kidding. She looked hard at Ivy. Ivy smiled sweetly. But if you wanted to make extra sure, you could give it a present too, just to be on the safe side. What? said Zuzu. You could give the ghost a present, said Ivy, for it to carry to the grave, just in case there is such a thing as ghosts. Zuzu stared at Ivy. I don't have a present. Ivy looked her over. That hair clip is nice, she said. Zuzu thought for a moment, and then she unhooked her pink butterfly hair clip. You can have it. I have lots of better ones at home, she said, giving it to Ivy. I'm sure the ghost will like it a lot, even if it doesn't have any hair, said Bean. It can use it for decoration, said Ivy. The bell rang. In the Haunted Bathroom the second grade ate its lunch faster than ever before. Doucet choked on his sandwich and almost threw up, but then Eric hit him on the back. After that, he was fine. Ivy couldn't eat her lunch at all. Bean only ate her cookies. Soon, all of the second grade and some of the first grade gathered around the play structure. They stared at Ivy and Bean and the jar of blue potion in Ivy's hand. The two girls started toward the haunted bathroom. About 20 kids followed along to watch. When they got to the breezeway where the bathroom was, everyone sat down on the benches along the sides. Bean started to feel a little sweaty. She tried to think about Ms. Arubitate saying that the bathroom wasn't haunted but she kept thinking about an army of ghosts. There was the portal. There was the bathroom door. It was just her and Ivy. And Leo. Leo's going in the girls' bathroom, hollered Eric from the bench. Leo's a girl, yelled Doucet. Leo gave a little jump and said, I'm not going in, you goons. I'm keeping watch. Turning to Ivy and Bean, he said, If the yard duty comes, I'll throw the ball at the door. They nodded. Ivy took a deep breath, reached out, and pushed the door open. Together, Ivy and Bean entered the bathroom. Inside was dim, and quiet. Bean noticed that it smelled better than it usually did. Do you feel it? said Ivy, looking around. Nothing happened. After a moment, Bean stopped feeling sweaty. She was glad there wasn't an army, but she wanted to see one ghost at least. She squinted and then popped her eyes out. There. Yes, she said and I see the mist. A thin cloud was just fading in the corner. They stood still. 
Do you hear something? Bean whispered. It was a smooth, sighing sound. It sounded as if it was coming from very far away. I hear it, Ivy whispered. That was a little spooky. Bean began to feel sweaty again. We'd better start chanting, Ivy breathed. Noise would help. Yeah, said Bean. We come in peace, she whispered. We come in peace, said Ivy loudly. She raised her hands to the ceiling and fluttered her fingers down. Bean fluttered her fingers too. Oh, ghost friend, haunt our school no more. Her voice was louder now. Lie peacefully under our school, wailed Ivy. That was better. The bathroom wasn't spooky anymore. She began to turn in circles, waving her hands. Now Bean whirled around too, shouting, Take our respectful greeting and fly away. This was getting fun. Farewell, shrieked Ivy, spinning faster and faster. Return to your resting place and we will honor you forever. She jumped a few times. Be gone. Leave the bathroom of Emerson School, screamed Bean. She did a few high kicks. Leave the bathroom of Emerson School, screamed Ivy, jumping and whirling. She banged into one of the stall doors. Ow! Bean was still spinning. The bathroom zoomed around her. Whew! She stopped and held on to a stall. Can we do the potion now? She asked. Ivy unscrewed the lid of the jar and crouched down. The bathroom grew quiet. Ghost, be gone, she murmured and poured a line of potion in front of the door. She crawled around the edges of the bathroom, pouring. Be gone, Bean chanted softly. Ivy stuck her hand in something wet. Oh, yuck, she said. The bathroom was very quiet now. Peaceful. Three stalls down, one to go. It took a lot of concentration to pour evenly. Ivy made sure that she got every corner. The bright blue potion gleamed on the tile, and Ivy stopped under the paper towel dispenser to look at her work. It was pretty. She looked up. No mist. No sighing noise. The bathroom looked normal, except for the blue potion. The ghost was gone. I think we did it, she said, peering around. Bean squinted. Is it gone? Yes, said Ivy. Expelled, never to return. I'm sort of sad that it's over, said Bean. It was fun having a haunted bathroom. But we still have to do the presents, said Ivy, taking her fossil and Zuzu's hair clip out of her pocket. Bean took out her half dollar. How are we going to, she began. And then there was a bang on the door. Expelled. It was Leo's soccer ball. Bean started for the door. No, no, the presents, hissed Ivy. She stuffed the jar in the trash can and rushed into a stall. Bean rushed after her. What are you doing? Ivy was throwing the fossil and Zuzu's hair clip into the toilet. Give me your half dollar, she said. Quick. Bean handed it to her. Ivy threw that into the toilet, too. But why are you putting them in the... Bean began. The bathroom door wheezed open. How else are we going to get them underground? Ivy whispered. She flushed. Come out here this instant. They knew that voice. 
It wasn't Rose the Yard Duty. It was Mrs. Noble. Ivy and Bean came out of the stall. Mrs. Noble's wrinkles were all pointing downward in a terrible frown. Just what do you think you're doing in here? She boomed. Going to the bathroom? Said Ivy. It was all she could think of. She glanced at Bean. Help! There are 30 children huddled out in the hall staring at this bathroom like it's a television. I know you're up to something. Mrs. Noble snapped. You can tell me or you can tell the principal. She reached out and grabbed Bean by the shoulder. Her fingers were like claws. We just had to, to... Bean had no idea what she was going to say next. Then they heard something. A groan. A grinding. A gurgling. A sound of water. And then, from the toilet, a river of water came spilling and splashing over the side and onto the tiles. There was a lot of it, and it didn't stop coming. Something under the floor was making a lot of noise. The water ran over the sides of the toilet and streamed across the tile floor. Mrs. Noble let go of Bean's shoulder and took a step backward. The water flowed toward her red high heels, and she stepped back again. We heard the toilet making a funny noise, said Ivy, watching the water roll across the floor. We were trying to fix it when you came in. But it's still broken, said Bean. The toilet water sloshed around their shoes. It's kind of gross, isn't it? Said Ivy to Mrs. Noble. At least there's no you-know-what in it, said Bean. Mrs. Noble didn't answer. She hopped backward, but the water touched her red high heels anyway. Disgusting! She hopped. Disgusting! I'll call the janitor. Ugh! She hopped again, yanked the door open, and was gone. Ivy and Bean stepped into the breezeway, their shoes making wet marks on the cement. Leo was leaning against the wall with his soccer ball under his arm. Most of the others were still sitting on the benches. Well, said Emma, what happened? The ghost has been expelled said Ivy, but it wasn't easy. Mrs. Noble ran, said Vanessa. Bean shrugged. She was scared. She couldn't take it. Well, she came in during a very scary part, Ivy said. That ghost really wanted to stay in the bathroom. What did it look like? Eric asked. Ivy looked at Bean. Strange. Pale. Bean looked at Ivy. Almost like water. Like water, said Emma. Weird. So it's gone, said Zuzu. For good? Yes, said Ivy. But I wouldn't go in there for a while. The bathroom got kind of messed up, said Bean. The second graders looked toward the bathroom door. They were quiet, thinking about the bathroom and Mrs. Noble and the ghost. Come on, said Eric. There's a little more recess left. They started walking down the breezeway. Ivy and Bean sat down on a bench. Leah looked at them. So what really happened in there, he asked. Secret said Bean. Leo bounced the soccer ball hard against the cement and caught it. Hey, I was the one who warned you that Mrs. Noble was coming. Bean looked at Ivy. Ivy looked out at the playground, where the second graders were getting back to their regular lunch recess stuff. Eric was chasing Drew. Michaela and Vanessa were pulling on a jump rope. The kindergartners were grinding rocks. 
Emma and Zuzu were practicing cartwheels again. Only Leo had stayed. Okay, we'll tell you. Leo slitted his eyes. Was there a ghost in there, really? Yes, said Ivy. Totally, said Bean. Leo glanced from one to the other. And that's why Mrs. Noble ran? Ivy looked at the sky. Well, actually, Mrs. Noble ran because the toilet overflowed on her shoes. The toilet overflowed on her shoes, Leo said. How come? Ivy flushed the ghost's presence down the toilet, explained Bean. You flushed a fossil, Leo laughed. And a half dollar and a hair clip. It seemed like the best way to send them, Ivy said. We didn't have time to dig a hole. She giggled. It was kind of funny. You guys are wacko, said Leo, laughing. The three of them walked down to the playground together. Hey, Leo, how do you play soccer anyway? Asked Bean. I'm getting kind of sick of gymnastics. I never really liked gymnastics very much, said Ivy. I can't do cartwheels. What a great day. What a great day, Bean thought. She was eating her ice cream on the front porch. She stirred hard, watching the chocolate part swirl into the vanilla part. Yum, ice cream soup. Ivy stepped out onto her front porch, holding an ice cream bar. Come over, yelled Bean. Ivy went back inside and came out after a moment. She started down the steps, stopping every few feet to lick the drips from her bar. What do you have? She asked as she sat down next to Bean. Ice cream soup, said Bean, showing her. Mmm. They ate in silence for a few minutes. Then, bang, the porch door slammed shut behind Nancy. You spilled on your shirt, she said to Bean. Bean looked down. She had spilled on her shirt. Oh, well, she said. Nancy sat down. It'll never come out, she said. Mom says you have to come in and do your math. Hi, Nancy, said Ivy. Hi, said Nancy in a not very friendly way. You're supposed to go in, Bean. Okay, said Bean without getting up. Did you get a new haircut, Nancy? Ivy asked. What? No, said Nancy. There was a pause. Why? Does my hair look different? Bean stared very hard at her milkshake. Ivy licked a drip. Yeah. She tilted her head to the side and looked at Nancy's hair. The bottom. There. It looks different. Kind of uneven, you know. It does, said Nancy, grabbing some hair and pulling it in front of her face. Yeah, sort of uneven, Ivy said. She cracked off a piece of chocolate coating and ate it. Nancy stared at her hair and then got up and went inside. Ivy and Bean finished their ice cream in silence. A really great day, thought Bean. The End You've been listening to Ivy and Bean and the Ghost That Had to Go by Annie Barrows, narrated by Cassandra Morris and directed by Ethan Abbott Gamache. This book is copyrighted 2006 by Annie Barrows. This recording is copyrighted 2007 by Recorded Books. If you've enjoyed this book and this performance, Recorded Books recommends Clementine by Sarah Pennypacker, 
Narrated by Jessica Almazi. Clementine is not having, shall we say, a good week. On Monday, she sent to the principal's office for cutting off Margaret's hair. On Tuesday, Margaret's mother is mad at her. Wednesday, she sent to the principal's office again. Thursday, Margaret stops speaking to her. Friday starts with yucky eggs and gets worse. And by Saturday, even her mother is mad at her. Okay, fine. Clementine is having a disastrous week. Sarah Pennypacker has created a quirky, hilarious, and altogether unforgettable character in Clementine. You'll find a wide selection of titles in the recorded books catalog, including bestsellers, mysteries, classics, histories, and more. Call us toll-free or log on to www.recordedbooks.com to learn about our latest releases and special offers, order another recorded book, or to read author interviews and narrator profiles. Don't forget to ask about easy 30-day rentals by mail. And thank you for being a Recorded Books reader. Recorded Books presents an unabridged recording of Ivy and Bean Break the Fossil Record by Annie Barrows, narrated by Cassandra Morris, and directed by Dave Millen. Drop everything. Boring, boring, boring. Bean turned her book upside down and tried to read it that way. Cool. Well, sort of cool. No, boring. Bean sighed and turned her book back right side up. It was a book about cats that she had picked from the school library. There was a different cat on each page. Bean liked cats, but reading about them was driving her crazy. All the cats looked the same, except the Sphinx cat, who didn't have any fur. He looked halfway between a dog and a rat. Bean liked him the best. I bet Ivy's never seen a Sphinx cat, thought Bean. She knew she wasn't supposed to talk during Drop Everything and Read, so she poked Ivy in the ribs. Ivy's eyes were binging across the pages of her book. Bing, bing, bing. She looked like she was watching a ping pong game. She didn't even notice Bean. So Bean poked her again. Hey, she whispered. Earth to Ivy. Hmm? Ivy mumbled. Looky here, it's a dog rat, Bean whispered louder. Ivy looked for a little tiny second. Oh, she said and went back to reading. Bean sighed again. All the other kids in Ms. Rubitate's second grade classroom were bent over their books. Even Eric, who usually fell out of his chair two or three times during Drop Everything and Read, was quiet. He had a book about man-eating sharks. McAdam was picking his nose. Bean raised her hand. Ms. Rubitate didn't see because she was reading too, so Bean called out, Ms. Rubitate. Shh, whispered Ms. Rubitate. What is it, Bean? There's a problem, and it starts with M, began Bean, looking hard at McAdam. And then N and P. She wiggled her finger next to her nose, just in case Ms. Rubitate needed an extra hint. Ms. Aruba Tate looked at McAdam, too. Then she put down her book and came over to Bean's table. I brought this from home especially for you, Bean, she said, holding out a big, shiny book. See? She pointed at the cover. It's The Amazing Book of World Records. I think you'll like it. Bean wasn't sure. What's a world record? When someone does something better or longer or weirder than anyone else in the whole world, 
That means they've set a world record. Weirder? Bean asked. That sounded interesting. Ms. Rubitate smiled. There's a man in here who walked on his hands for 870 miles. You mean on his hands and knees? Like a baby? No, just on his hands, with his feet in the air, said Ms. Rubitate. No way! Read the book, you'll see. Ms. Rubitate returned to her chair. Bean opened the shiny cover. On the very first page, there was a picture of a woman whose black hair trailed behind her like a fancy cape. Bean read that the hair was 19 feet long and that the woman had been growing it since she was 12. Wow, thought Bean. Doesn't it get dirt and bugs in it? Bean turned the page. Ew! A man was eating a scorpion. Double ew! He ate 30 scorpions a day. On the next page was a picture of a boy with 256 straws in his mouth. What did his mouth look like when there were no straws in it? Big and slobbery, Bean guessed. Ivy, she whispered. Ivy! Ivy's eyes stopped binging back and forth. What? Check this out! Carpet vipers, hula hoops, and two million teeth. He stuck 159 clothespins on his face, shouted Eric. Look at him! It was recess, but instead of soccer or jump rope or monkey bars, the second graders were huddled under the play structure. At the center of the circle were Bean and her book. Kids pulled the book back and forth, all trying to look at the pages at the same time. Look at her! 99 hula hoops at once, Vanessa squeaked. Around her neck, too. Look at this turnip. It weighs 39 pounds, said Doucet. Gross! I hate turnips, Eric said. My mom made me eat one once, and I spit it into the heater. I hate lima beans, said Doucet. Bean pulled the book back in her direction. After all, Ms. Rubitate had brought it especially for her. This guy has had more broken bones than any living human, read Bean. In the picture, he was smiling happily. He's broken his leg 14 times. On purpose? asked Emma. I guess so, said Bean. He jumps off of buildings. Drew slid the book his way. Hey, this guy collects teeth. He has two million teeth. This is the world's most poisonous snake, read Leo, pointing to another picture. It's called the carpet viper. Does it live in carpets? asked Zuzu. She looked worried. In India and Africa, said Leo. Not here. Bean slid the book back her way. Look, Zuzu, this girl did 109 cartwheels in a row. Let me see that. Zuzu grabbed the book and looked closely at the picture of a teenage girl in tights. I bet I could do 110. Bet you couldn't, said Eric. He grabbed the book from Zuzu and flipped through the pages. This dude, he ate 400 M&Ms in one minute, it says. That's nothing. I bet I could eat a thousand in one minute if I didn't chew. You'd choke, warned Leo. No, 
I've had lots of practice, said Eric. Look, said Bean, reaching over Eric's shoulder and flipping pages. Look at this kid. He's only a kid, and he made a world record for hanging spoons on his face. Fifteen. No glue, either. How do they stick? Asked Ivy, looking up from her book. I can't tell, Bean said. Sweat, maybe. Why would anyone hang spoons on their face? I don't know, but he made a world record. Bean looked at the picture. The kid was covered with spoons, but he still looked proud and happy because he had set a world record. I'm going to do 16 spoons, said Emma, staring at the picture. Hey, I was going to do 16, said Bean. She wanted to set a record and have her picture in the amazing book of world records. Spoon seemed pretty easy. And, unlike some of the records, spoons didn't hurt. But now Emma had dibs. Dang. I'm going to eat 500 M&Ms in a minute, Eric said. Where are you going to get 500 M&Ms? Asked Doucet. Eric thought for a moment. My uncle gave me $10 for my birthday. My dad said I could spend it on anything I want. I'm going to do 111 cartwheels, said Zuzu, tucking her pink shirt into her pink pants and reclipping her hair. I'm going to see if Ms. Rubitate has any spoons, said Emma. Emma and Zuzu walked off, looking important. Bean felt left out. What could she do? She flipped through the pages until she came to a picture of a woman holding a broken glass. What? Was there a record for breaking the most glasses? No. The woman had broken it by singing in a really high voice. Ah, uh, sang Bean, but softly. Ivy was still reading. What's that book about anyway? Asked Bean. When Ivy looked up, her eyes were shining. This girl, Mary Anning was her name. She found the first whole ichthyosaur fossil in the world. She was only 12 when she did it, too. She lived near the beach, and one day, she saw a skeleton face in the cliffs. So she dug it out. It took her a long time, and everybody made fun of her, but she didn't care. And it was an ichthyosaur. Only nobody knew about dinosaurs then. She also found a plesiosaur, and a pterodactyl. See, this is her. Ivy showed Bean a picture of a girl in a tall hat. She wasn't very pretty, but she was famous and important. Bean sighed. She was unfamous and unimportant. There had to be some way she could fix that. On your mark, get set, yikes. The first 40 straws were easy peasy. Bean stuck them all in her mouth at once. Then she opened another box of straws. Oh, she said to Ivy, pointing. More, are you sure, asked Ivy. Bean nodded. Ooh, ar, he, uh, huh, she grunted, which meant 257. Ivy pulled a straw out of the box and shoved it into Bean's mouth. But she accidentally shoved too hard, and the straw scraped the back of Bean's throat. Hack, choked Bean, and the straws sprayed across the kitchen floor. Ivy winced. Sorry. Ow, 
Bean's eyes were watering. She looked at the straws all over the kitchen and thought about Mary Anning. She wasn't a quitter, and neither was Bean. She began to pick up the straws. Ivy helped. Once again, she shoved 40 straws in her mouth, and very carefully, Ivy pushed in one more. 41, 42, 43. The girls were working so hard that they didn't hear Bean's dad come into the kitchen. 44. Hi, Ivy. Hi. Bean, what have you got in your mouth? Bean's dad said, staring. Oh, said Bean. Straws, said Ivy helpfully. She's breaking a world record. Excellent, Bean's dad said, leaning over to see better. How many does she need to get in there? 257, said Ivy. She looked at Bean. Bean nodded. How many does she have in now? 44. Her father didn't say anything, but Bean knew what he was thinking. It was no good. She was never going to get 257 straws in her mouth. Sadly, she pulled the straws out. I'll never break a world's record. She handed the spitty straws to her father. Thanks a lot, said Dad. Maybe there's a different record you could break. Like what? asked Bean. I can't walk on my hands. Bean's dad glanced at the sink. He hadn't washed the breakfast dishes yet. Why don't you set the record for fast dishwashing? He said, smiling. That would be a good one. Bean ran to get the book. There were no records for fastest dishwasher. This is going to be a piece of cake, said Bean, looking at the counter piled with plates. You could do it slowly and still break the record, said Ivy. It'll be better to do it fast, said Bean. Super fast. Then no one will ever break my record. Her father began to look a little worried. Maybe this isn't a very good idea. Dad, every day you and Mom tell me I have to wash the dishes, said Bean. And now, when I finally want to, you say it's not a good idea. She shook her head. Grown-ups were so weird. Well, said her dad, okay, but be careful. What was he talking about? She was always careful. Bean began running nice warm water in the sink. She squirted out a big jet of soap and mountains of bubbles grew. Keep your eyes peeled, she said to Ivy. You'll probably only see a blur. Bean's father ran his hands through his hair. Couldn't you grow the longest fingernails instead? He asked. Takes too long. You're the official timekeeper, Ivy, said Bean as the water gushed. And Dad, you have to take a picture of me when I'm done, with all the shiny clean plates. Sure, said her dad. I'm going to do all these plates in five minutes, said Bean. Got that? Five minutes. Okay, said Ivy, looking at the clock. On your mark, get set, go. Bean grabbed a plate and plunged it into the water. Wipe, wipe, wipe. She rinsed it in the next door sink. Rinse, rinse, rinse. She put it in the dish rack. Okay, next plate. Wipe, wipe, wipe. Rinse, rinse, rinse. Dish rack. How am I doing? One minute gone, said Ivy. 
Wow. Bean looked at the pile of plates. She would have to hurry. Quickly, she put two plates in the soap and wiped them. Quickly, she rinsed them. Rack, again. Wipe, rinse, rack, again. Wipe, rinse, rack, again. Wipe, rinse, rack, again. How many more minutes? Yelled Bean as she scrubbed. You've got half a minute left, said Ivy. Oh no. Frantically, Bean took two more plates and plunged them in the soap. Zip, she wiped them. Zip, she put them in the clean water. Dish rack. Only 10 more seconds, called Ivy. There was one more plate left. Bean whizzed it into the soap and shook it. Hurry. She whizzed it into the clean water. Hurry. One more second. Bean panicked. Yah, she screeched, hurling the plate at the dish rack. It flew over the rack and crashed to the floor, shattering into a million pieces. There was a stunned silence. Ivy, Bean, and Bean's dad stared at the little bits of plate sprinkled over the floor. Finally, Bean spoke. Did I do it in five minutes? Ivy shook her head. No. Dang. What a scream. When Bean's older sister Nancy wanted her room painted yellow, Bean's mother said that Bean could pick out a new color for her room too. Bean picked green. Not light, sweet green. Deep, rich green, the color of emeralds. Everyone told her she would get tired of it, but she hadn't. Bean loved her room. It was small and cozy. Her bed was in one corner, her toy box in another, her dresser in a third, and best of all, her basket chair was in the fourth. She liked to sit in her chair and pretend that she was an ape girl living in a jungle treehouse. She had made a lot of pictures of jungle animals and stuck them on the wall. The best was the toucan. We could draw, said Ivy, looking at the pictures. We could draw dinosaurs. I don't want to draw. I want to break a world record, said Bean. Don't you? Ivy shrugged. Not really. Seems like a lot of work for nothing. I don't want spoons all over my face. But then you'd be famous, said Bean. But I don't care if I'm famous for spoons on my face. If I'm going to be famous, I want to be famous for something important, like Mary Anning. Bean shook her head. Spoons would be fine with her, but spoons were taken. Bean stared at her green wall and tried to get an idea. Ivy lay down on Bean's bed and tried to imagine finding an ichthyosaur. Quiet minutes went by. Hey, said Bean. Ivy looked at her. I've got a great idea, said Bean. This was going to be easy. I'm good at screaming, and I'm good at breaking things, right? I guess so. I'll break a glass by screaming, said Bean. I'll be the youngest person ever to do it. What? You scream and throw a glass? Ivy looked confused. You already did that with a plate. No, the scream breaks the glass. This lady in the book did it. She screamed so loud that a wine glass shattered. But she was old. I could probably scream louder because I'm young. I'll be a record breaker. That's a good record, said Ivy. That'll be fun. She bounced a little on Bean's bed. 
Okay, said Bean. I'll need a wine glass. I'll go get it. She jumped up, and then she sat down again. Her dad was still sweeping up little pieces of plate. He probably wouldn't be very happy to find out that she was planning to break something else. Maybe she could find something made of glass upstairs where he wouldn't need to know about it. Not a mirror. That was bad luck. But there had to be something she could use. I've got it, she yelled. Got what? Nancy's glass animals. I'll shatter one of them. It'll be even better than a wine glass. Won't Nancy get mad? Bean pictured Nancy's face and then quickly put it out of her mind. No, she has gazillions of them. And besides, I'll glue the animal back together when I'm done. She won't even notice. I hope, she added silently. Ivy went on a spying mission down the hall, past Nancy's room. The coast is clear, she reported when she came back. She's not in her room. Okie doke, said Bean. She took a deep breath and headed for the door on super quiet tiptoe. Nancy's room was very organized. All her books were neatly arranged by color. Her yarn for knitting was rolled into tight balls. Her friendship bracelets were lying side by side on her dresser. And her glass animals were lined up in two long straight rows across the top of her bookshelf. It was like a glass animal army. Nancy had been collecting them since she was five. She had plain china cats and dogs and turtles the kind that you can get at the drugstore. But she also had some fancy animals too. Tiny dolphins and horses and butterflies. She had a beautiful unicorn with a blue glass horn and a peacock made of glass that shimmered like rainbows. Bean wasn't going to hurt him. But right in the middle of the army was a gloopy looking octopus with eight squiggly legs. That was the one, Bean decided. Its legs were thin. They would probably pop right off if she gave a good scream. And they'd be easy to glue back on. Nancy would never have to know. Bean grabbed the octopus and stuffed it down her shirt, just to be safe. She tiptoed back to her room. Got it, she said setting the octopus on her dresser. She took a few short breaths to get in the mood and looked hard at the little octopus. Its gloopy head dangled on one side. Prepare to die, she told it and opened her mouth. Then she paused and looked at Ivy. You might want to cover your ears. Okay. Ivy stuck her fingers in her ears. Bean screamed as loud and high and shattering as she could. The octopus just sat there. It didn't even crack. So Bean screamed again, louder than she had ever screamed before. But even through her scream, Bean could hear another sound. It was the sound of her father running up the stairs very, very fast. A second later, he burst through the door. What? What's the matter? He shouted. His face was whitish gray. Bean stopped screaming. Nothing, she said. What's the matter with you? Watch your tail, Mary Anning. It was cold outside. The two girls squished into Bean's tiny playhouse. How long do we have to stay out here? Asked Ivy. I don't know. He said until dinner, but I don't think he meant it. Bean sighed. 
She knew he meant it. Is your mom home? Not yet, I don't think. Bummer. He'll let us in if it starts raining, won't he? Yeah, but I don't think it's going to rain, said Bean, peering out the bitty window at the sky. Mary Anning used to go out hunting for fossils in storms. She didn't mind, said Ivy. She built her own wooden tower next to the cliff where she saw the skeleton, and she lay down on it and chipped the ichthyosaur out of the cliff, even though the tower was shaking and the rain was pouring down on her. Why didn't she just wait until it stopped raining? asked Bean. She was afraid that the bones would get washed away in the storm, explained Ivy. Wow. Bean pictured herself lying bravely on top of a shaking wooden tower with rain falling in her eyes. It took her a year to get the whole body out, Ivy added. Chip, 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 a tiny bit at a time. A year? yelped Bean. Didn't she get bored out of her mind? No, said Ivy. It takes a lot of patience to dig up fossils. She sat up and peered out the other bitty window of the playhouse. Dinosaurs lived all over, you know. I know. There were dinosaurs around here, too. Not ichthyosaurs, but other kinds. Maybe just little ones, said Bean. Maybe just little ones, said Ivy. But still, dinosaurs. I've always liked those little ones with the deadly claws, said Bean. Mary Anning found fossils right on the top of the ground, but sometimes they're buried deep in the dirt. We might have to dig for a long time before we find one. That's okay. We're patient, said Bean. She was beginning to get it. Where do you keep your shovels, said Ivy. Bean loved to dig. Her shovel flashed and dirt flew through the air. Soon, there was a nice wide hole next to the trampoline. Ivy knelt beside it and ran her fingers through the dirt. We have to inspect every bit of it. Ivy said. Even slivers of bone are important to paleontologists. What's that? That's us, said Ivy. The people who dig up dinosaurs are called paleontologists. Cool. Bean felt cheerful. She loved the crunch of her shovel as it went into the earth. She loved hurling the dirt behind her without looking. Whee! Hey, watch out! You got dirt in my hair, cried Ivy. We're paleontologists. We can't be afraid of a little dirt, yelled Bean. The hole was almost two feet deep, and the dirt was getting darker and wetter. She flung a big hunk of it over her shoulder. Ouch! Something bounced off of Ivy's head and landed next to her knee. She picked it up, brushing away the mud that was stuck to it. What was it? It was about as long as her hand. It was narrow at one end and flared out at the other. It was grayish brown. It was a bone. Bean, Ivy gasped. Look it, I got one. Bean's shovel crashed to the ground, and she rushed to Ivy's side. Ivy handed her the gray-brown bone. Bean stared at it, and then gave a long whistle. Watch your tail, Mary Anning, she said. Here we come. Ivy Beanosaur they dug for half an hour without finding any more bones. 
Bean was on the edge of giving up. She figured that one bone was a lot more than most people found. But then she thought of Mary Anning chip, chip, chipping for a year. She didn't want to be wimpier than Mary Anning. Or Ivy. So she dug and dug. Ivy's nose was running, and she had mud all over her. Also, her feet had gone to sleep from being kneeled on. But she didn't give up either. She combed through each new load of dirt with her fingers, feeling for bones. She found a lot of rocks. She found a marble. She found a piece of blue plastic. Then her fingers, burrowing into the mud like worms, plucked out another bone. This one was shorter and thicker, but it was definitely a bone. I got another one, she called. Bean dropped down beside her and looked at the gray-brown lump. We rock, she said. No, we fossil, giggled Ivy. She dusted the bone carefully and put it next to the first one. We can put them together later, she said. How do you put them together if you don't know which dinosaur it is? Asked Bean. It's like a puzzle, I think. You look for pieces that fit together, said Ivy. We can look in dinosaur books, too, so it's a lot easier for us than for Mary Anning. She didn't have any pictures to look at. But, she remembered, Mary Anning found the whole ichthyosaur, so she didn't need to put it together. It's sort of cheating to find the whole thing, said Bean. Oh, man, here's a big one. She fished around in the dirt and pulled out a thick, heavy bone. It was a very serious looking bone. Bean held it up. It reached from her hand to her elbow. She whistled. This is no little cute dinosaur. This is a big, scary dinosaur. What if that's just its little finger? Said Ivy dreamily. Monsterosaur, said Bean. Ivy Beanosaur, said Ivy. You're supposed to name them after the person who discovered them. Bean giggled. Then her shovel hit something hard. Another bone appeared. This one's smooth and rounded. Whoa, Nellie, cried Bean. I think I got a piece of its skull. A few minutes later, Bean found another small bone. Ivy found two more, one big, the other medium. There was no doubt about it. The backyard had been swarming with dinosaurs. You know, Ivy said, holding up her ninth bone. They didn't even call out when they found them now. Mary Anning was 12 when she found her ichthyosaur. We're only seven. We're probably the youngest paleontologists in the world. Bean stopped digging and leaned on her shovel. The youngest paleontologists in the world? Ivy, you know what that means? Huh? It means we're record breakers. Ivy stopped rubbing dirt. She and Bean grinned at each other. Youngest paleontologists in the world, said Ivy. That's way better than spoons. By the time Ivy had to go home, the girls had found 17 bones. They were all different sizes, but they were clearly from the same dinosaur because they were all the same shade of grayish brown. Bean's father called her in for dinner. Bean washed off most of the dirt and sat down at the dining room table. She smiled, thinking about the dinosaur skeleton she and Ivy were going to build. They were totally awesome. They would probably be on TV. Her parents would have to let her watch TV if she was on it. Bean noticed that Nancy was sneering at her. She was still mad about the octopus. 
If I ever catch you looking at one of my glass animals again, you'll be sorry. Nancy hissed while their father served up their pasta. What am I supposed to do? Put a blindfold on when I go into your room? You're not supposed to go into my room, said Nancy. Because it's my room. Daddy, can I get a lock on my door? No, said Dad, bringing in their bowls. Bean stared at her pasta. It looked funny, but she decided not to say so. This pasta looks weird, said Nancy. That's what I thought, but I didn't say it, said Bean. Mom says if you can't say something nice about your food, you shouldn't say anything at all. Nancy lifted one eyebrow and said, Little children who break dishes, steal other people's stuff, and screech their brains out have no right to talk about what other people do. How about if we don't talk at all for a little while? Suggested Dad. Fine with me, said Nancy. Me too, said Bean. So she didn't tell them anything about the amazing dinosaur find in the backyard. Serves them right, she thought. I'll be the youngest paleontologist in the world, and they won't even know it. Believe it or not. Breaking a world record is harder than it looks, said Emma the next day at recess. The second graders who had gathered around the amazing book of world records the day before were huddled under the play structure again, without the book. I could get two spoons stuck on my cheeks no problem, Emma went on. And for a second, I got three. But that's all. I wish the book said how that kid did it. Did you try your nose? Asked Drew. Sure I tried my nose, Emma said. It slid right off. Maybe he has a very sticky face, said Ivy. Maybe he even put something on his face to make it sticky. Maybe, said Emma. But forget it. I'm tired of trying to put spoons on my face. There was a silence. Bean didn't want to be a braggy kid. Everyone hates braggy kids. She would wait to tell about the dinosaur bones until someone else told about breaking a record. How'd the cartwheels go? She asked Zuzu. Super great, said Zuzu. You did it? Asked Ivy. A hundred and eleven cartwheels? Everyone looked impressed. Wow, that's great. Are you going to be in the book? Zuzu pulled the zipper on her jacket down and up. I didn't do a hundred and eleven cartwheels. I did thirty-two. She looked around at the faces watching her. That's a lot. I set the record for Emerson's school for sure. There was a short silence while everyone thought about that. Then Bean said, did you fall down or what? I crashed into the fence, said Zuzu. Got a bunch of splinters. She held up her knee. It looked like she had pepper under her skin. Ouch, said Ivy. She hated splinters. If my backyard was a mile long, I bet I could have done it said Zuzu. Eric's not at school today, said Vanessa. I wonder if he ate 500 M&Ms. He didn't, said Doucet. He ate 112, and then he threw up. But 112 is hardly anything. He didn't chew, said Doucet. He just poured them down his throat. Yuck said Emma. 
That's gross. His mom is really mad, said Doucet glumly. She took the rest of his money away. What about you, Bean? Asked Vanessa. Did you get all those straws in your mouth? Straws? Bean had almost forgotten the straws. Oh, no, but Ivy and I broke another record. How many did you get in? Asked Zuzu. What? Oh, 44. But guys, said Bean, Ivy and I broke another record yesterday afternoon. She stopped and waited. Well, said Vanessa, what record? We became the youngest paleontologists in the world. There was a little pause. What's a paleontologist? Asked Drew. A person who digs up dinosaur bones, said Bean. And that's what we did. We dug 17 dinosaur bones out of my backyard yesterday. And today, we're going to get more. And then we're going to put them together and make a dinosaur skeleton. Nobody said anything. Isn't that cool, said Bean. What was the matter with them? You did not, said Doucet, finally. We did too, cried Bean. Seventeen dinosaur bones? No way, said Emma. Yes way, said Bean firmly. Zuzu and Emma gave each other a look. Bean felt her face get hot. People don't just find dinosaur bones, said Vanessa in a grown-up voice. Dinosaur bones aren't just lying around. Sometimes they are, said Ivy. That's how Mary Anning found them. Until yesterday, Mary Anning was the youngest paleontologist in the world, said Bean, trying again. Now, Ivy and I are. You can't just say you broke a record and get in the book, said Vanessa. You have to prove it. We can prove it, said Ivy. Her face was getting a little pink, too. We have the bones. How do we know that they're not chicken bones you stuck in the ground yourself, Vanessa said. They're not chicken bones. They're big. You can come over and see them if you don't believe us, said Bean. Okay, said Vanessa. I will. In fact, you can all come over, said Bean. I invite you all over for a dinosaur bone viewing. So there. Fine. When, said Emma. You can come this afternoon, Bean decided. But don't come early, because Ivy and I have paleontology to do. You'd better come and see them today, said Ivy. When they're in the museum, you'll have to pay. Come on, Bean. They turned their backs on the play structure and walked toward the classroom. A Bone to Pick Bean could hardly wait for the end of the day. Finally, Ms. Rubitate said, Put up your chairs, boys and girls, just like she always did. Bean and Ivy put up their chairs, wham, wham, and hurried out of the classroom. Wait, you guys. Leo ran down the breezeway and stood in front of them. They waited. Did you really? He said. What? said Ivy in a huffy voice. Find dinosaur bones. He looked at them with narrow eyes. Bean's face got hot again. Leo was their friend, and friends believed you. He shouldn't think they were lying. It made her mad. Yes, we did, she yelled. And we have proof. Anyone who doesn't believe us can come over and see. 
Four o'clock, today, my house, dinosaurs. She glared at Leo. Bring everyone you know. Bring your stupid soccer team. I don't care. Jeez, said Leo. Lighten up. Excuse me, said Ivy, still in a huffy voice. We have work to do. She pulled Bean by the arm. A skinny first grader plucked at her jacket when she reached the stairs. I heard you found dinosaur bones, he said. Yes, we did, said Bean in a loud voice. We found dinosaur bones. He looked at her nervously. Can I see them? Oh, Bean had been ready for a fight. She tried to make her face into a smile as she told the kid where she lived. Come by later this afternoon, she said. Okay, he smiled. Can I bring my mom? Bring anyone you want. As they walked home, Ivy said, nobody believed Mary Anning either. They thought that the bones were just weird rocks. They told her to stop wasting her time, but in the end, she was right. Who cares what other people think? Bean stepped over a crack in the sidewalk. I do. I want other people to know I'm right, especially when I really am right. Ivy thought for a moment. But you're still right, even if they don't think so. I guess, Bean sighed. I just feel better if other people think I'm right too. Hardly anybody ever thinks I'm right, said Ivy. Bean nodded. That was true. A lot of people didn't understand Ivy's ideas. She had had plenty of practice at not being believed. That's probably why she didn't get as mad about it as Bean did. She just went ahead with her ideas anyway. You can do whatever you want if you don't care what people think, Bean realized. But you have to do it alone a lot of the time. They climbed the stairs to Bean's front porch. We need a good snack, said Bean. We have lots of digging to do. A great big snack, agreed Ivy. What do you have? Trail mix, said Bean, the kind with chocolate chips. Cool, we can eat it while we dig. We should be kind of quiet, Bean added. I think my dad is still a little grumpy from yesterday. But he wasn't. He was standing in the front hall with a big smile on his face. Hi, girls, he called out. How was school? Learn anything good? What's two plus two? Eight? Bean giggled. Sometimes her dad was a goofball. Four, she said. Wrong again. He slapped his head. You want a snack? I made banana bread. You did? How come? Bean said. Because I make great banana bread. Duh, he said, bustling toward the kitchen. He was awfully cheerful. Bean put her hands on her hips. What's going on around here, Dad? Why are you so happy? Dad stopped bustling toward the kitchen. I'm glad to see you, he said. Bean looked at him. I am. Then he said, it was quiet around here today. Mom says it's peaceful when we're gone, said Bean. I don't like peaceful. I was lonely, her dad admitted. Bean laughed. Hey, you're just like me. Her dad had been so lonely that he had made three loaves of banana bread. He cut two thick slices and poured two glasses of milk and brought them to the kitchen table. 
Then he sat down to watch Bean and Ivy eat. What are you guys up to this afternoon? He asked. The girls exchanged glances. It's a secret, said Bean slowly. If she told him, he might want to help, and that would ruin the youngest paleontologist record. He was old. But by the end of the afternoon, you'll know. The end of the afternoon? He looked disappointed. Oh. Ivy felt sorry for him. Thanks for the banana bread, she said. It was delicious. You're welcome. He picked up the newspaper. See you later, said Bean, getting up. She stopped and turned back to the table. There might be some kids coming over later, she said. Just in the yard. He was reading. Kids. Great, he said. Dorcasaurus. I think we better stop now. We've got to start putting them together, Ivy said. Okay. Bean's arms were tired anyway. We can always dig up more later. There seemed to be no end to the bones in the ground. They had found four more since they had begun. The bone pile was getting high. Both girls stared at it. Hmm, said Ivy. Hmm, said Bean. They never talk about this part in books, said Ivy. Should we lay them out and see what fits? That's how you do puzzles. Sure, okay, said Bean. There's some clean grass over there. Lying out on the grass, the 21 bones didn't look much like a dinosaur. It didn't look much like anything. Maybe it's just one part of a dinosaur, said Bean. Or maybe it's a small dinosaur, said Ivy. Remember, the small ones were more common. Right. Ivy picked up the rounded piece that Bean had found the day before. Let's start with this. It's a piece of skull. She put it down on the ground, apart from the other bones. So now we have to find a neck. Bean picked up the long, thick bone. I bet this is a neck. Ivy tilted her head to one side as she looked at it. I think you're right. This was fun. Oh, the neck bone's connected to the shoulder bone, sang Bean. Ivy put down a small bone that was almost the shape of a shoulder. And the shoulder bone's connected to the arm bone. There it is. Ivy put down a narrow bone. And the arm bone's connected to the hand bone. They didn't have hands, Ivy giggled. How about the backbone? Okay, the backbone. Ivy put down the first bone they had found. It flared out at one end. That's the hip, said Ivy. Right, said Bean. Then she sang. The hip bone's connected to the leg bone. Piece by piece, they made a dinosaur. It was a small dinosaur, and some parts of it were missing, but they would probably find those the next time they dug. When they had it all arranged, they stood back to look at it. Pretty good, said Ivy. Don't you think we should stick it together? Yeah, I think they do it with wire in museums. Do you have any wire? Wire? I don't think so, said Bean. Ivy thought for a minute. Just for now, we could use tape. We can take it off when we get some wire. Tape, 
You got it. Bean ran inside. I think it's almost 3.30, she said when she came out. In-betweens were hard. She was only positive when it was exactly an o'clock. This won't take long, Ivy said, pulling out a long piece of tape. She wrapped it around the skull and connected the other end to the neck bone. She had to wrap it four times before it stuck. Bean began to work on the foot. It only had one foot. They were working so hard that they didn't see Nancy until she was standing right next to them. That's disgusting, she said, staring at their dinosaur. Bean jumped. For some reason, she didn't want Nancy to know about the dinosaur. Go away, she said. What is that? Nancy asked. Bean would never have answered in a million years, but Ivy didn't know about sisters. It's a dinosaur, she said. A Comsognathus, I think. A dinosaur? Nancy began to laugh a high, mean laugh. You think that's a dinosaur? Bug off, potato face, yelled Bean. She was getting a bad feeling. It's a Dorcasaurus, squealed Nancy. She held her stomach like it hurt from laughing. Bean glared at her. You guys are total losers. A dog buried those. The people who lived here before us had a dog. Look, she pointed at the neck bone. That's a steak bone? Get out of here, shouted Bean. She looked around wildly for something to throw at her. Don't worry, I'm leaving, said Nancy, smiling. Wait till I tell Dad. He's going to be mad that you dug up the yard. She stood on the back porch and made an L for loser sign with her finger and thumb. Shut up, screamed Bean. She looked over at Ivy. Ivy was just sitting in the dirt. Bean stared at the dinosaur. Dog bones? Is that why they were so easy to find? Bean felt heavy all of a sudden. She wasn't the youngest paleontologist in the world anymore. Mary Anning still had the record. And Bean had nothing. Maybe she's wrong, said Ivy finally. Maybe, said Bean. Somehow, she didn't feel very hopeful. The back door opened, and Bean looked up, ready to shout at Nancy. But it wasn't Nancy. It was her dad. He came down the stairs slowly, looking at the hole and the dirt pile and the bones. Then he looked at Bean and Ivy, sitting quietly on the ground. Are you mad about the hole? Bean asked. No, the hole's fine, he said. He squatted down next to her and looked at the dinosaur they had taped together. Nancy says they're dog bones, said Bean. He nodded. Are they? asked Bean. I don't know, he said. They might be. Could they be dinosaur bones? asked Ivy. I don't think so, he said slowly. I'm pretty sure that if there were dinosaur bones here, they'd be buried deeper in the ground. I see that you worked really hard, though. Yeah, said Bean. She felt like crying. There was a knock on the backyard gate. Who's that? asked Bean's dad. Everybody, said Ivy glumly. The Bones of Mystery Bean! Ivy! squalled a voice. 
open the gate. I'm going to have to run away, thought Bean. She stood up, preparing for takeoff. Open up, you guys. That was Leo. I'm going to be late for practice. I'm running away, said Bean. It was nice knowing you, she said to her dad. Wait a second, said Ivy. She looked at Bean's dad. You don't know what these are the bones of, do you? Nope, can't say I do, he said. So you're saying these bones are pretty mysterious, aren't you? Asked Ivy. Sure, they're pretty mysterious. The most mysterious bones you've ever seen? He smiled. You bet. Ivy nodded. Good. Bean! Ivy turned to Bean. Don't worry, it's going to be okay. She walked calmly toward the back gate and opened it. People streamed in. Bean couldn't believe how many there were. Vanessa, Drew, Doucet, Emma, Zuzu, Sophie W and Sophie S, Marco, Anya, Nashim, Jared, Leo with five guys she didn't know, Leo's sister Kiki, Isaiah, two fourth grade girls who Bean didn't know the names of, Leanne from down the street, the skinny little first grader, along with about six other skinny little first graders, some tiny brothers and sisters, and assorted moms. Hi, said Bean in a small voice. What was she going to say to all these people? What happens next? Bean's dad whispered in her ear. I don't know, said Bean nervously. The tiny kids started playing in Bean's playhouse, and the moms stood around the edges of the yard looking like they were late for something else. But the big kids crowded around Ivy and Bean. They didn't look really friendly. So, let's see the dinosaur bones, said Vanessa. Yeah, squeaked the skinny first grader. Showtime. Then Bean heard Ivy take a deep breath. Attention, please, Ivy called. She climbed up onto the trampoline and stood there, looking down at everyone. I have an announcement. What, said Leo. Not even Mary Anning was as brave as Ivy, Bean thought. She felt suddenly lighter. The crowd grew quiet, watching Ivy. She cleared her throat. This afternoon, we had a visit from an expert, and he told us that these, Ivy pointed to the bones, are not, I repeat, not dinosaur bones. She looked at the crowd below her. The expert was unable to identify these bones. He says these are the most mysterious bones he has ever seen. Because of that, he has decided to name them the Bones of Mystery. Wow, Bones of Mystery. That's exactly what they were. Bean climbed onto the trampoline and stood beside Ivy. These are the bones of a creature never before seen, she said in a loud voice. Possibly a man-eating, saber-toothed, deadly clawed creature. We will let you know what the creature is as soon as studies have been done, said Ivy. We regret any inconvenience. There was a silence. Ivy and Bean looked down at the kids standing around the trampoline. They looked back. Finally, the skinny first grader said, Can I touch the bones of mystery? You may, said Bean, feeling like a queen. 
Kids quickly clustered around the bones, inspecting them and fingering their dirty dryness. Then Bean's dad spoke up. I have an announcement too, he said. Banana bread will be served in just a moment. Guests are invited to jump on the trampoline in the meantime. Cool, said Deucet, dropping his bone. Let me up there. Me too, yelled Emma. I bet I can do a flip. So can I, said Zuzu. There was a rush for the trampoline. Ivy and Bean climbed down to let the others up. Vanessa stood nearby. I told you they weren't dinosaur bones, she said. Bean sucked in her breath. She knew what she had to say. You were right and we were wrong, she said. Probably. I think it's pretty exciting to find a creature that's never before been seen, said Ivy. Especially a saber-toothed one. Have some banana bread, said Bean's dad, coming up to them with a plate piled high. Thanks, said Vanessa. She took two pieces. Leo was poking the bones with his foot. Bones of mystery, he said. You guys are wacko. Ivy and Bean looked at each other. That's what they said about Mary Anning. Another day, another record. The banana bread ran out quickly, but nobody left. Kids were digging and jumping and running around. The first graders were spraying the hose into Bean's hole. The moms were standing in a circle, chatting. Bean found her dad sitting on the stairs. Will you go get your camera? She asked. Please? He put his arm around her. Why? I think I'm breaking a record, Bean said. Oh yeah? What record? Biggest play date ever. Come on, go get the camera. You have to have proof. Bean gave him a shove. Okay, okay. He got up and went inside. Ivy climbed the stairs and sat next to her. I'm still bummed that they aren't dinosaur bones, she said. Yeah, Bean said. She was still bummed too. She had really wanted to be the youngest paleontologist in the world. She looked out over the backyard full of kids. Maybe it wasn't going to be the biggest play date in the world either. She should probably have a backup. I think I should try to break glass by screaming again. A wine glass, not an animal. Ivy nodded. A wine glass would be easier. I'm going to do it, tomorrow. Bean's dad came back out on the porch with the camera. What are you going to do tomorrow? He asked. Bean and Ivy smiled at each other. Never mind, said Bean. The End You've been listening to Ivy and Bean Break the Fossil Record by Annie Barrows, narrated by Cassandra Morris, and directed by Dave Millen. This book is copyrighted 2007 by Annie Barrows. This recording is copyrighted 2007 by Recorded Books. If you've enjoyed this book and this performance, Recorded Books recommends Annie and Snowball and the Dress-Up Birthday Party by Cynthia Ryland also narrated by Cassandra Morris. Annie and her pet bunny Snowball love living next door to Annie's favorite cousin Henry and his dog Mudge. Whether it's playing frisbee or watching old movies, there's no shortage of fun to be had when these four are together. Annie's birthday is coming up, and she can't wait to invite Henry and Mudge over for a dress-up party. And when the guests arrive, Annie gets a big surprise. You'll find a wide selection of titles in the Recorded Books catalog, including bestsellers, mysteries, classics, 
histories, and more. Call us toll-free or log on to www.recordedbooks.com to learn about our latest releases and special offers, order another recorded book, or to read author interviews and narrator profiles. Don't forget to ask about easy 30-day rentals by mail. And thank you for being a Recorded Books reader.